do you want an HDMI or do you want a Wi-Fi? HDMI is great. Yeah. Wi-Fi is great too. Actually, Wi-Fi would be great. All right. <laughs> So um, I'll give you while he's setting up. I'll just give you guys this, this uh, behind. Uh, I'll give you like what I sort of see is the uh, the distilled stuff from BTA and the distilled stuff from Menlo and the distilled stuff from Dowstack. I'm not sure who's caught up on what. So uh, this is Jeff Pulver. Uh, he was he's the founding member of the BTA. He's been involved uh, in global public policy since. He founded the Vaughn Coalition in 96, uh, which essentially means that we owe him a thank you because without him, we wouldn't have free internet calls. So he's the guy that made sure that we, that, that none of this stuff was regulated as a telecom, which is, means that we can just have free Skype calls and stuff. Uh, so uh, it contributed to the worldwide growth of the VoIP industry. The impact of the FCC's issuance of the Pulver Order continues to be felt today worldwide by consumers as well as everyone involved in the communications industry. Uh, and so the, 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 the fundamentals behind what they're trying to do is um, encourage transparency, uh, support uh, anti-money laundering you know, and LKYC stuff, and uh, the, the third is no promise of future profits, no front running, no insider trading, even if you're a private company. And that's like basically the whole idea. Uh, which I think is valuable. I, like we see more and more conferences that are like, you know, Bitcoin Miami, which is just like the, the antithesis of, I think, everything that's holy in the world. So, uh, um, I think that it's it's useful to be a part of a, a group of people that are self-regulating, that are trying to create uh, a useful um, economic system. Most work in the states now, like they want to be there. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, we can talk about that actually. Um, Rhode Island, um, the yeah the governor. Yeah, we can talk. So Gina Raimondo spoke to us about wanting to encourage. Yeah, the door is it's uh, open. open. Yeah. Okay. So people can come and buzz me. Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah, we had so we had this conference um, last the, the, two the, weeks the, ago. The, the 2018 Rhode Island Blockchain Summit. The the branding. Uh, right there. Um, and so Rhode Island is basically trying to bring more business um, to the state and they're trying to create laws that will encourage uh, legitimate uh, token sales uh, rather than like a bit license situation which we all know is sort of draconian. Um, so Raimondo was, was really uh, progressive about like uh, encouraging development um, I actually spoke to her and I said, I gave her three really quick things before she ran out the door. I was like, what would be really useful is government issued identities like uh, Estonia, uh, uh, accepting cryptocurrency for local property taxes or income taxes. And then the third would be like, uh, um, like a decentralized exchange that was able to take transaction fees. I, I suggested to the Secretary of Commerce that to issue this rule on it. To the residents of Rhode Island, the it's, it's, it's they buy the mini bonds for the city or the state, that they could offer all these, you know, from access to museums to parking and all sorts of other perks associated with the mini bonds. Usually those things are low. So if you have to you know, create a to tokenized mini bond and actually create, have a digital security, a programmable security, it would be something that could be of interest. And the state of Rhode Island is not so far to basically offer uh, almost free, if not free, uh, um, housing for companies, control location space. And I believe the CEO of uh, Natural Grid is based in Providence, and he's offered for miners <coughs> the cheapest power of anywhere in the United States. It's like 14 cents per kilowatt hour, which is cheap. So if people want to set up mining operations, what they call the Superman movie. The, super, the first original Superman movie uh, was filmed in Providence, and it, there's a building that looks like, actually, it's cool. I thought it was downtown LA as uh, City I Hall. They, they call it the Superman movie, or <laughs> I don't know. But it's what they, I, 
you see the building and it looks semi familiar. It's like, oh, what was it? I didn't say no. Okay. And so they're offering free, uh, it's empty right now, so it's offering free uh, co location space and, and basically the cheapest power anyone can get in America. How do they afford that? Uh, they, they, they're looking to build jobs. I mean, this is a, the, 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 the governor is a former venture capitalist. And she actually, what I didn't know, the stat that really I found very alarming or very interesting is. Rhode Island leads the country in the number of high school students who go to college, graduate from college, and they also lead the country in the number of people who leave their state after college. And so she is offering college students who stay in Rhode Island the opportunity to have the state pay off their student loans. So they have a really good uh, access to, to, to uh, very intelligent, high potential, great future team members. It's just a matter for them to, uh, some people to come forward. So they, they look to everyone in the room to work with them, and uh, they were very open to our ideas. And, I, and I'll tell you that, when I, when I was, so I got involved with Voice Over IP very accidentally in 1995, and uh, I, my project that I ran was I watched, I have a background in communications, but from being a hobbyist, I happened to grow up in a world where amateur radio was my thing, and I grew up in a world where I liked to connect, I was always curious about how to connect telephones and radio together. And so uh, it was natural for me that if we were in Canada, or Puerto Rico, we want to talk to a friend in New York City, I would do a phone patch. It was very simple, very kinky, but I did it. And in 95, I was running a mailing list for people very interested in talking on the internet. And somebody asked, is it possible to interconnect a telephone and a computer? And a month later, I launched a project called Free World Dialogue. It was free to connect to the world and around dialogue. And the good thing was free, because if I was charging even a penny per minute, I would have been shot, shut down, perhaps put in jail. But it was a free project. And that opened me up to this whole world of regulatory stuff. Because six months later, 300 phone companies went to the Federal Communications Commission asking for the sale and use of the internet telephony software to be banned in America and the makers to be regulated as phone companies. And then I was always on the defense. And so I, I created out of, I was working at uh, Wall Street, but in my spare time, I, I created this out of thin air the Voice in the Net Coalition. I had no, I had no background being uh, an executive director of, uh, of a not-for-profit lobbying organization. I made it up, I literally made it up, did it. And for nine years, we kept VOIP unregulated. And, but I never, when, it, when this process happened, I ended up then helping to create the Voice of IP industry. I started a company called Vonage and this other stuff, but that's not so important. So the, the thing is, is the, um, while we were doing that, people, it was states against us. People were taking a proactive stance against the innovation. What I found fascinating about the state of Rhode Island was the first time in my history where I saw a governor saying, hey, we love you guys. Come do business in our state, as opposed to saying, gee, what are you bypassing? What, what, what taxes have we, can we pay you for? This was the total, complete opposite to see. So I, so I told the governor and anyone who was listening that they could, the entire day that we were there, they were being defensive that they were a tiny state. And my response to that is maybe a tiny state, but you don't have to apologize to that because you're very big in vision. And I, I stand by that. I really like the idea that they were really proactive trying to bring innovative technologies into the state. So, um, and, it was, and Newport was quite nice too. There, we, had, we had a police escort. There, there also, there, there, I was also, um, we're talking about the, uh, the, the Blockchain Token Association uh, 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 conference in, in Rhode Island. Uh, Sort of catch you up. We, we met with the governor and a bunch of other state legislators. The, the other takeaway was um, that they, like, as much as we know in the room about blockchain, or, or, or I don't know, some people are new. I don't, I don't know, but as much as we know, they know like almost nothing. And so, like, we there was a guy who spoke there who was like the real estate like owner, He's a former, former mayor of Providence. Well, yeah, the guy who like owns all the land there. Like, which we would all like to tokenize and resell on a secondary market, right? But like, that doesn't mean like thing to him. And so when we talk like, oh, well, why don't we have like, we'll, we'll have hash deeds for the land so that people, when they get, a, you know, so they have their mortgage, so they don't even know what the hell we're talking about. Um, and uh, so that's like, that's like on us as an association to like just tell people what's going on so that they understand what we're, we're talking about. Um, so, yeah. That was, that was Rhode Island. So just just to wrap up, so the Blockchain Token Association. So I, I have this background in uh, public policy and, and 
Washington. I, uh, the, the Voice on that Coalition still exists today. It's still a 501c6. It's a lobbying organization. It's uh, global and focused, but really focuses on US stuff in real life. Um, when I got involved with uh, my friend Stephen Nereoff, an alchemist, uh, and I was reading about all these um, subpoenas going out and, and all this darkness associated with crypto. I actually to pull up blockchain, not crypto, because for me, uh, knowing Stephen is sort of like an entry point into Gotham City. And, and once you get into Gotham City, it's very hard to get out. But I, I look at Stephen as Batman. So I always, uh, I always introduce myself as Robins plus one. But uh, these days I'm not so sure. But the, uh, uh, but, but there was a darkness associated with it. So I created back in March what I called the Securities Token Association because I wanted to provide absolute clarity. So because I discovered this was maybe you don't even know this, but do you know what murder and SEC felonies have in common? The discovery of SEC felonies have in common? There's no, there's no time limit. There's no time limit. That's right. <laughs> Precision is a killer thing. Imagine doing a project and seven years later the SEC says, oh, by the way, you're in violation of the law, and then you go to jail, and you're gonna give back all the money you took plus the, all the appreciation and value that it has. And not only that, but everyone who advises you on that project either is gonna pay a fine or perhaps go to jail too. That's a little scary shit. See, when I took on, when I took on different governments around the world to change communication policy, I didn't worry about going to jail. So I could be a little out there, a little open, and have fun, but I didn't worry about this no time limit stuff. So I, I'm, I very much like to live outside the lines, but when it comes to black and white stuff, where I can avoid prosecution by following the law, I became the most stringent advocate of, at least even if we don't understand it, try to at least find a space that's where I could actually operate under. So I became an advocate of uh, of security, if you're going to tokenize, do it as a security, at least you understand the laws for private placements. And so I created the Security Token Association primarily as a defensive strategy to promote best practices. Can, can we talk about that as a group actually? Like, sure. Because I, I think that there are some interesting people in the room who would like to talk about this. So there, um, I will make the supposition that I, that I don't think the SEC views the utility tokens are even real. Um, I would argue that they're maybe meeting this whole year and perhaps this summer trying to understand what that really means. The rumor that I last heard, so we have a lobbyist at the BTA. You may have met Kara at the meeting. So according to Kara, um, they will know by the end of the summer, which by definition would be the third week in September, but I don't want to hold anyone to it, that what a definition of utility token might be. The, the current thinking is that the CFTC will be responsible for some type of utility token, that the SEC gets everything else. There probably will not be a carve out that's either grandfathered and there will be maybe no safe harbor. Or maybe there will be. But right now, you know, as an advisor, it's very hard. Imagine having clients and having problems being associated with them puts you at high risk. So, uh, yes? I was gonna ask about like, Ethereum because they're trying to say that it's, it's a utility or go back because what you're saying is like, well, the, the, the Ethereum is two things. They, they said that Ethereum itself is not a security. Well, it was because it was sufficiently decentralized, which is on its issue. Wildly vague. Security. Wildly vague. And, I, and, and what's still not clear is whether or not the original Ethereum sale, what they did not rule on, is whether the original Ethereum sale mm. was or was, or was or was not in yes. violation of security. Well, they haven't ruled on that. Yeah. That, that is that, that there are there are challenges because like decentralization that. is of course a spectrum but as we all know but like is it decentralization of ownership of Ethereum uh, is it of the network is it of mining power as well well, well there there is a, there was a very loud controlling voice for a long time that that may have altered some of that history which is what uh, why why it's not definitively what well, the way I understand it why it's not definitively ruled on so there's risk. Yeah, I have an unrelated question to that, but how do you think a blockchain fork will have security tokens? Um, depends upon the fork. Um, I, look, I, I think the, the bigger challenge, first of all, I, I live in a world of being, where being misunderstood mm -hmm. is usually okay. I grew up as a misfit, and, 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 and as we have, if we have misfit tokens, it's totally cool. Um, but when, when the government tries to do things proactively, not so much to regulate you, but to give confidence and safety to what they call Main Street. Yeah. That's, that's the conflict. So when, you know, to go back to the original, so there were three ICOs on uh, uh, Bitcoin that happened. And when Stephen was working with the 
Vitalik, which became the Ethereum crowd sale, which was five times bigger than they ever had a crowd sale before, all the, their entire mantra was, we do not want to go to jail. Mm -hmm. That was basically what they were saying, is we want to raise money, and we don't want to go to jail. And they were comparing themselves to Kickstarter and Indiegogo, and what they were pre-selling as their product was the, uh, the gas, or the, the, the cost to run a remote application on their network. And uh, Steven's idea was, he was calling it a functional token, mm -hmm. not a utility. Utility came, came later as slag, but it was, he was defining it was a, a functional token. And they had these ideas that you need to be on the blockchain, you need to have current functionality, and you needed to um, um, have an app, there are certain parameters which they were which they went for. And the, the challenge is that, that's nice they said that, because they were trying not to fall under the parlance of securities law. They even went so far to work with a former SEC chairman, um, whose law firm they went to, who wrote a most likely to not letter, meaning that they got a law firm to write that, and that's the only one they had at that time, in fact, in the history of all this, where that this project is most likely to not it's most likely not a security. Mm -hmm. what, what I didn't realize until two months ago is that letter went to Switzerland. And the reason why Crypto Valley exists, the reason why they're able to change 300 year old laws in Switzerland was not from a legal law, but from a letter ruling that said that Ethereum is most likely than not, is not a security, which created, allowed the Ethereum Foundation to set up shop. That letter was taken to Singapore. And that is how Singapore changed its securities law. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with the reality, just that this letter exists. So, it's like um, the Magna Carta. Of it, <laughs> it became, and so when it comes to forks, you know, first you're dealing with people who are trying to put things in boxes <coughs> when we don't even know what the parameters are, what the diameters are, what the circumferences are. And so they were first working on trying to be understood, or at least not misunderstood. Um, can uh, a fork of what was one type of instrument become a security? Absolutely. You know, the, the biggest challenge, I, the reason why I became an advocate of security tokens, by the way, is nothing to do with any of that. It's just that I don't want to go to jail. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I found that horseshit that, um, excuse me, but I just found it a little bs -y that if you have an amazing project, and, which had a token, and you're not allowed to publicly ever talk about your project in fear that your, pro that your token will go up in value because somebody will think that you're doing amazing. That doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, it's one thing to speculate. It's one thing for someone to create a token where someone is speculating where they think it's gonna go from 10 cents to $4 because that's what it should go. Uh, but imagine the entire life of your company, you can never go out and make public statements about your real business that happens to have a token in it that with anything you say, if, it's, if, it, if, you, if you mess up what's called the Howey test, you now are playing with securities law. As opposed to having a new way to raise capital where you actually issue a token that represents nothing more than perhaps a dividend, perhaps it's based on your top line, where you're raising, let's say, $10 million or $50 million. I'm gonna give you a 10% uh, of, my, of my revenue. I don't use blockchain, and I don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, a, I'm allowed to make forward-looking statements. I don't need a white paper, but I do need to file a private placement. And I'm allowed to go around the world, go to conferences, and speak about my future success, and not be in fear that the SEC or some other organization is going to find me for being open and bold about what I do. So from a, from a practical business perspective, um, I find that a security token from an owner, from an owner's <coughs> perspective, an entrepreneur's perspective, is much more open to opportunities, as opposed to being restricted. And so having guidance that, that utility tokens of a certain type can fall under the CFTC, that's actually a good thing, because then we'll know what the rules could be. Um, but for me, as an advocate of trying to help people raise funds, um, it's not that you, they don't like blockchain at the SEC, but it's a private placement. It's just a certain set of rules to follow. So if you did one thing and you forked it, and all of a sudden in that fork you have all these other characteristics that appear to be more like a security than not, um, theoretically it could you know, be misunderstood. So it creates a challenge. I guess my point was less whether or not a token can be recognized as a security through a fork, but more if there is a token that is recognized as a security, 
that gets, um, you know, blockchain fork happens and you have two identical versions of that security token now, do you have any thoughts on what the security issuer recognizes as their token or what the crowd recognizes? I, I'll tell you this, right now under the current securities law, which can be modified by the way, this is why we have lobbyists, today um, utility to uh, security tokens are only offered for sale to accredited investors. Mm -hmm. But after a one year period of time, the restriction can be removed and then unaccredited investors can actually purchase them. Which means that you can actually program utility, uh, secu utility functionality into security tokens. So a lot, a, lot, a lot of people look at security tokens that they can't have utility because then it doesn't make sense. But in reality, after a year, one year hold, they can actually be used the same way that utility tokens could have been used. Mm -hmm. So in, ter in terms of what can happen, it's, it's every case is different. And I do think what will happen in practical life is uh, there will be case law that people will go to the Supreme Court. People go to the IRS, you know, because you have the IRS right now saying it's property. You have the CFTC asserting jurisdiction. You have the SEC asserting jurisdiction. You actually have the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, which has its own set of issues. And you have every state in America that wants to also protect consumers. So this is a real mess. Um, and it will take some lawsuits and some case law to yeah. actually help better answer your question. It's, um, but that's why I'm happy to take on the, the edge case, the fringe cases. Mm -hmm. But for me, having a, a black and white, so, so when I created the, the, so what happened with the Security Token Association, I announced it, a lot of my friends said, hey, we love what you're doing, we want to support you. But all, these are all people that actually issued utility tokens. So I, I renamed the, uh, the, the process of ICO to stand for um, uh, Internet Crowd um, um, Offering, offering a set, in, in, instead of an initial, and so because you're going to the crowd. And then that didn't really help me so much. So at Consensus, I rebranded the Security Token Association, the Blockchain Token Association. Why? Because I was staring at the bathrooms at Consensus and I found a uh, gender neutral bathroom and I realized that we're a token neutral organization. That, that in America, you know, you can be born a security token, but really relate to utility, so it's fine by us. You know, we, we, we're not judgmental. We, we are the Rainbow Token Coalition. And so we, we like tokens of all kinds, whether we advocate on behalf of the security token, the utility token, or the type of token to be named later. So we're open to all. And so uh, right now we have more international members than we have domestic members. We have uh, founding members from the United States, from New Zealand, from uh, um, from uh, China and hopefully soon from um, uh, from Japan. I'm talking to a company tonight who wants to join as a founding member. And so it's yeah for me it's it's a, it's a domestically we get to lobby and internationally I'm looking to promote best practices. So we're like a, a global marketing organization looking to take the best of the best that we hold people accountable and have accountability because there are a lot of things that haven't happened yet. We haven't figured out. If if any of you want to issue tokens and you have a large you know, portfolio of them, to mark to market is really hard. Because if you were to actually take your position and put it to the market, you might drop, well, forget about today's market, but in, if it was May's market, you might still drop the price down to close to zero if you flood the market with too many tokens. So there are a lot of rules that haven't yet been ruled. There's, there's gap, there's tax issues, and all sorts of implications. So there's a lot of things to be figured out. So as an organization, you know, we're, I'm hoping to take stances on some of that. Um, when I ran these conferences, which helped create the voice of the IP industry, the events I did were very good at bringing engineers together to hum harmonize some protocols. And so there was a, well, you may have ERC-20 and you have up to ERC, I think, 1200 so right now. As you get into security tokens, it's like, it's like living in 2018, but going back to 1967. And there's a lot of things that have to happen on the security side to allow Wall Street to function properly. And a lot of harmonization has to happen between exchanges, between issuers, and a lot of protocol stuff just has to happen. And we're working with T0, and I can tell you firsthand from, that no one is an island, that we all need to work together to help create and move a marketplace. So I found that historically that it's better for a trade association to support protocols than for a company to put out a protocol and hope everyone adopts it. I don't know if it works, I don't know how blockchain will go, but at least the VOIP went that, the communication sector that went that way. So we're looking to our members to have working groups to help promote stuff and to have conversations and to even lay us on with other working groups and other organizations to help grow stuff. You know, I'm not saying we have the answers to everything,
but I do know that if we just stand by and do nothing, that bad things could happen. So well, well, I guess that's a good thing for Matan to. Do you think that we could run the BTA on Dow Stack? Sure, why not? Depending what which decisions you wanna. But I mean, basically, Dow Stack is designed in a way that you can manage any sort of decisions uh, that you wish and can code your governance system, basically. So, uh, are, how many of you guys are familiar with Dow Stack? Just, just show of hands. Okay. So generally, um, can 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 um, can we talk about on-chain versus off-chain governance, and maybe uh, that's sure. sort of the. Yeah. So I guess I guess what you mean by on-chain, I mean different people mean different things. So firstly, hi, Matan, my name. Uh, I'm completely jet lag, and I'm just checking that my flight is delayed, so I have some less pressure. Um, so yeah, so I think most people, when they speak about on, I mean, again, different people speak about on-chain governance in different terms, so I'll tell you what I think most people say. So when people think about on-chain governance, they speak about um, kind of like the governance of the chain. So, so there, are, look, there are three things, basically three layers if you wish. The governance of the chain, governance based on the chain of other things, and then governance outside of the chain. So that's basically the like three layers, and you can call them whatever you want. Um, what, like, especially, we, we are just dealing about the, the middle layers. So we're not dealing about the governance of the chain. We're not dealing about governance completely off the double F, the chain. And we are dealing about the governance based on the chain uh, of things other than the chain. Um, however, much of the module, models that we develop, I think, are applicable actually also for on-chain governance as well, like for the chain governance as well. Um, like, is, I, I'm not just just asking, like, is it a good time to just dive, dive deep? Yeah, or? Do, you, do you guys want to dive into, into DAO stack's uh, stack a bit? Is yeah, that sure. good? Yeah. OK. Yeah, do you want to do that? Yeah. That's, that, so, I mean, yeah, it's, it's informal enough so that we can just go in whatever direction people feel more interested. So just well, what would what also be interesting is, like, as Menlo's here, they're in the back, hello, guys. Uh, uh, it, it, what would be, and, and also, like, Jake is here, you know, from CoinFund, and yeah. a lot of the companies that you know are working with, with you guys. And so um, I, what I would find useful is, like, like, where would Menlo plug in specifically? And, like, you know, like, what would be the first step I mean, we can. Yeah, so you can you can start wherever you want to start, but like right. that would be an interesting right. So let me maybe let me list a list of topics that might be interesting. Right? You can maybe you can do like a yeah, yeah. thing for each of them. So firstly, we can talk about vision of DAOs. I I don't know what's the level of uh, familiarity with crypto and DAOs here in the audience. You should tell me. But we can talk about the vision of DAOs. What we mean by DAOs? What why we think DAOs are like super superior to existing organizations? Why they will, I think that DAOs will actually be the most impactful thing that the blockchain basically um, will give birth to. Um, and also, I think the future of organization is in the more near future than people think. So we can think about, speak about the vision of DAOs. We can speak about the architecture of DAOs. Like what are the components that need to be in place in order to make DAOs a, a real thing? And that will lead us to the DAO stack, which is basically the technological stack for DAOs. Um, so I can think of, speak about the different layers and you know what to need to be where. And then we can dive into, like you can zoom in and speak about the main layer on top of the blockchain. Uh, we call it the arc. Just arc as in uh, monarchy, hierarchy. So the arc framework for governance, which is basically a second layer on top of Solidity, on top of Ethereum right now. That is, is kind of like a language, just as much as the, um, I guess, Ethereum is a language for smart contract, and ARC is a language, is like a higher la level language for governance. So you can take any governance protocol and break it into its letters and, and words and implement it on top of ARC. And eventually, what another maybe way to imagine it is like a WordPress for organizations. So WordPress, you have a certain framework, and then you have a growing library, open source library, that anyone can build modules and plugins. Then you can combine modules and plugins and make your website. In the same way, we have broken governance the logic of governance into letters, into modules and plugins, and then you can combine those modules and plugins, or if you wish a new protocol, you can make your own new plugin or module, and then you can combine them and build any sort of organization. So this is the maybe next topic that we can speak about. And then it gets getting even more interesting because actually governance of DAOs has a real problem that has not been solved yet, and that's why we don't see DAOs yet. 
So there is a real problem, there is a real bottleneck. It's just to give you a hint, it's the scalability problem. Just as it's, still, it's the cousin of the scalability problem for blockchain, it's really the cousin of it. It's actually the same problem. Philosophically, it's the same problem. But in DAOs, in people, it's much more severe. So you basically run, to, to, you know, you run your head to the wall, basically it's step one. So you have to solve this, this, just as much as you have to solve the scalability problem for blockchain, you have to solve the scalability problem for governance. Um, and then we, I can tell you about a neat, I think, new, new novel solution to that, so, which is also the cousin of off-chain computation, what the off-chain computation do for, for blockchain, and uh, holographic consensus, as we call it, does for governance. So I can tell you about holographic consensus and how it works. And then two more topics, and then we can choose. Um, I can tell you about like the first interface for the DAO stack, which is a real application, which is on the mainnet and should go live today maybe in a couple of weeks, because today usually means in a couple of weeks. Um, but basically, it's a, it's a platform for decentralized management of funds. So it's a real, like, real implementation of all of the principles that I can describe to you. Um, and then you can, I can show you a demo, and it's, uh, the demo is in staging, but roughly working, uh, not too buggy. And then finally, I can tell you about real experiments that are going to take place in the next couple of months. Um, one of them is like internal, but like we are opening Alchemy, the platform for decentralized budgeting, we're going to put a fund there and let the community play with that fund in a similar fashion, uh, supporting for contributors, supporting the DAO stack ecosystem. And then we have another experiment with Gnosis that are, they have been putting their Dutch X centralized exchange uh, live, and then we are putting a DAO that will manage that, that DEX. So it will be like a fully decentralized ecosystem. I think the first actually fully decentralized DEX. And it's really like even the, the parameter of the platform will be managed by a DAO. Um, I can tell you, I think, I mean, it's still kind of like in progress, but since we're kind of like just kind of moving forward, I can tell you about the experiments we'll be doing with UA. Um, yeah, and a few other experiments. So these are the list of topics, but I'm just, just, I just, I wasn't sure about like what's the width of the discussion. If it should be like 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 40 minutes. Uh, um, Matt, what, what, how would you like to, Roll Menlo into this chain. So, uh, so we're making the framework uh, kind of like Rails for for DApps. So uh, uh, it's a framework for building uh, web applications that, that don't have a single point of failure. So from a developer's perspective, it's not terribly dissimilar from a traditional web ar architecture, except it's it's um, completely decentralized. So like loading the use case would be like decentralized Yelp, you know, where there's not a single point of failure. But then the fact that there, it's decentralized opens up like a galaxy of opportunities of stuff that can be built that is like literally that possible. Awesome. So um, a, a decentralized ICO marketplace, like all the ICOs in the world they can buy like with, with one click. So that's like, that's impossible for a number of reasons right now. Um, because everyone's relying on either, you know, uh, doing it with government regulation or for a like, centralized server. Our, our technology like, allows for that. And that's like a super low hanging fruit use case. So what I'm interested in, um, uh, um, uh, Matan, is like, I'm super interested in like what, so obviously DAOs can be, have, the first use case of a DAO is to disrupt the venture capital, right? So that's beautiful. Uh, people vote on like what, where, how money should be uh, aggregated. Like, I'm, I'm interested to hear what, at scale, like, what new things do you think DAOs could give the world in, in five years? Right. So, firstly, when I say DAOs, or when I speak about DAOs, like I actually mean, so DAOs versus end ups, so there's like kind of like Continuous spectrum between DAO and DAO, like show like creature that is not clear if it's a DAO or a DAO, somewhere in between. Um, and generally, there are four categories. So let's just call them DAOs, okay? When I say DAO, just think DAOs or DAOs. Um, so there are four categories of DAOs or DAOs that, that I, I have in mind, or that I ever like every every DAO or DAO that I've heard heard of can fall under those four categories. So. First category is, is DAOs for collaboration. So just a bunch of people, bunch equal million, let's say, um, creating stuff, like building stuff. 
collaborating to open source, you know, do open source development. Uh, where we are now speaking with our group, like thousands of uh, 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 engineers, like building like real stuff that you could touch, um, or uh, or content, you know, content writers that can write a book together. So that, that will be under the umbrella of collaborations. Um, the second category would be, um, so it's kind of like similar, but also, so in the first one, basically the collaboration is managing some sort of funds, either exter of external token or internal token, in order to incentivize contribution. The second one is also managing funds, but not for sake of producing things. So it's basically, the the category of asset management, pure asset management. So for example, the centralized investment funds would be on the second category. Um, the centralized insurance fund, central pension, and so on and so forth. This will be the second category. So management of fund for sake of funds. The third category would be um, curation, so Yelp. So Yelp would be like a low-hanging fruit, so anything which is decentralized. Again, when I say decentralized creation, I mean that there is a collective, again, maybe thousands, maybe millions of people who grade certain object. It can be grading restaurants and creating centralized deal, but it can be grading website and creating centralized Google. Now that's dramatic. Or a, or a BTA in, in this case. Yeah, or, or, or anything basically. And, and that's dramatic because not, so there are two things that a crowd can do better than others. So one, can, it can scale up. If you decentralize your curation, you can scale up with, you know, the amount of curation you can do, the capacity. However, Wait, it cannot scale up above algorithms. So things that are not algorithmized will, you know, will crowd, 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 crowdification of that will scale it up. Things that, that, are, are, that are algorithmized, such as Google, the advantage of crowd, crowdsourcing it or decentralizing, the centralized search engine will be that you can subjectivize it, right? So Google is, has an objective protocol, and if you, if you wish, it shows you a single value system, the curation engine, that is in the world. Now, of course, it adds some personalization per your clicks, but if you actually look at it, the personalization, if, you, if I do a search and you do a search, you'll see that you'll get pretty similar results. So it's not that, actually there's just one value system. But imagine that you had a crowd curating things with respect to different DAOs, different value system. You know, what, what is an interesting website, right? When I do a search, I get an interesting website, a good website, but when I write a keyword, right? But good or relevant with respect to what value system? Good with respect to who? To which uh, attesters? So the, my point is that the decentralized search engine will be to have you, you'll be, be able to ask much more subjective questions. I want to I want to know what what is the best blockchain according to the Ethereum supporters. I want to know what is the best blockchain according to the EOS supporter, and so on and so forth. You could speak with that hive mind in a much more subjective manner that you can speak today with Google. Um, so that's curation is the third category. The fourth category, I, we were least interested at in the beginning, you'll see why, and now it actually become one of the more interesting uh, areas. So the fourth category are applications actually that don't require per se collective decision making, so there is no, so because they are peer-to-peer. -peer. So basically marketplaces, so exchanges, uh, ride sharing, uh, eBay, centralized eBay, and so on and so forth. So the interaction, the atomic interaction is peer to peer, and thus there is no collective decision making that an agent produce an outcome. So we thought, yeah, we don't, we don't need governance there, so probably we don't have a use case there. But it turns out that those marketplaces, they have a lot of parameters and stuff there that is hard coded, and they, they want to be upgradable also in central, the centralized manner, because it doesn't, doesn't work to have a centralized marketplace, and eventually there's a centralized point of failure that controls that, the parameters of that marketplace or the upgradability of that contract. So a decentralized marketplace would like to be owned by a decentralized organization. And then that's like the use case that we are working on with Gnosis and, and speaking with others. So you're asking what, what are the low hanging fruits? I think there are so many that's, that's you know, I don't know if it's exciting or frustrating, but there are so many low hanging fruits and I see all of them are pretty viable in five years. Um, I think that, for example, the decentralized investment fund is like a very easy one, and everyone understands it. Um, the challenge there is that 
it's easy it's easier to deploy if you um, if you invest in tokens if you invest in real assets it's that you need a, you need a legal legal layer that connects the blockchain with the real world of course the second sorry the second uh, the, uh, challenge is the re regulatory challenge so that's one I think vertical this is very exciting that I know I mean I almost every VC that I speak with says yeah we want to have that experiment so we're just looking for someone to kind of like pick it up um, another low-hanging fruit, which is coming up, I think, soon, is collaboration. And specifically, we try to think, we try to think, and that's why we did that for me, we try to think, out of collaboration, what would be like the MVP, the minimal, the dwarf collaboration done? Because collaboration has a lot of components to it, and I can describe those components. And we realize that there is a piece of decentralized collaboration, which is really, really simple, which is just, Look, I'm giving you a fund, external fund. There is no circular economy. There is no token, nothing. There's just a fund, given fund that, you know, 10,000 ether, and you want to manage that fund for a certain purpose. You're not going to be, pro you're, not gonna, you're not trying to be profitable. You're, not, you're trying to spend that fund. And it turns out that that's actually a real problem. So today you have quite a bunch of projects that are managing hundreds of millions of dollars of funds. And if you ask, so Ethereum, Ethereum Foundation themselves, they're, you know, they're managing about a billion dollar fund or half a billion dollar fund depending on the value of Ether. They and have and to, how are they elected and who chose them and all of this other So, so one hand is, yeah, it's, it's like the politics of that, but there's a, there's a harder problem or more, I would say, acute problem, which is, I mean, Ethereum would like to progress faster. For example, they would like to solve the scalability problem. And you can ask, what is the limiting factor for solving the scalability problem? Why, is, is it the shortage of money? The answer is no, there is infinite amount of money. There is more money than they would ever be able to spend. Is it, a, is it the limit of shortage of human resources? There's not enough developers interested to solve that problem. No, I think there are like hundreds and thousands of developers that could and wish to solve that problem. I think the only limiting factor is the decision-making capacity to deploy infinite fund into infinite human resources. It's just decision-making capacity. And that's why today there are four different independent funds, two from within the information, two from out the Ethereum Foundation, they are managing a few hundreds of millions of dollars of grant programs just to solve those problems. But again, the limited factor is those four committees that can, you know, screen just as much um, uh, proposals per month, and that's the limited factor for innovation. So what if you have a new platform that can manage, you know, millions of dollars a month effectively, or, or tens of millions of dollars a month? Uh, tens of millions of dollars a month effectively, or hundreds of millions of dollars effectively, because you have this single decision making process that not just five people are looking at your proposal, but 500 people are looking at the proposal in a way that creates consensus effectively. And that's what holographic consensus does. Do, can, I exactly just, what, can I just, uh, Rocco or Jeff or Jake, Matt, do you, do you want, or, does anyone else want to refute or weigh in on that? I have a question on the holographic consensus after. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I want to put someone on the spot here because uh, no, uh, there's a lot of us in the room. I, 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 there, there's so much to, to dig into. I mean, he, he, these ideas are very like um, one uh, game theoretic uh, issue that that we're always dealing with. Menlo is how do you prevent you know off chain fusions. I'm sure this is like you know, the first, the first as, as you talk about this model, I'm sure that's like the first question that you get asked, right? How do you do that? Mm -hmm. What is the current port? So for a you know, DAO-based fund, what is the uh, current solution to prevent sort of an off-chain collusion? Uh, you know, parties colluding to you know, deploy funds to various entities. Sure. I mean, we, want, we, can dig, we can dig into that. I mean, we can dig into holographic consensus how it works. Basically, I would say that um, maybe I can say some comments and then you can decide if you want to make more of a circular discussion or dive deep. But one comment is that any system is always, well, Vitalik just published something else, but any governance system is, is sensitive to 51% of that. And that's, I would say that's not a bug, that's a feature. If 51% if, 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 if says such and such, that's, you know, what, that's what the DAO wants. But on the other hand, that's why I would argue that reputation systems are much better than token systems. So token-based voting is, 
I think it doesn't work well because of 51% of tax, for example. Not, not just, but, all, but, but also. And then reputation systems are much harder to corrupt. So to corrupt 51% of reputation system is very hard, and it's almost impossible to be done um, not automatically, not with smart contracts. Okay? If it was easy to, to coordinate 51% off-chain, we wouldn't need DAOs anymore. So because that's, that's, that's the problem that DAOs are trying to solve. They're trying to solve the coordination problem of large crowds. So it's almost impossible to coordinate 51% off-chain, but then if you try to coordinate on-chain, it means that it's public. Everyone knows that you're corrupting. Now, if people are, uh, if reputation holders, reputable agents in a DAO are cooperating with a corruption process, then, then I, I would say that this DAO should die. So DAOs that will, co will cooperate with those 51% attack um, will die and should die. Now, the, the, the more complicated question, how do you, um, how do you make um, systems that are not corruptible on a much lower collusion level? And the thing is that, and that's, that's exactly going to what says, so basically just to say the title and then, then let someone else uh, speak. So basically, if you're, trying, if you're trying naively to demand too high, um, I would say, consensus threshold, so let's say you're asking 50% of all reputation holders to say yes on something, then you get a completely resilient system, but a completely unscalable system. So no, no decision will be made, or definitely not a lot of decisions. But then if you're taking down your consensus threshold to, to zero continuously, then you get a very scalable system, but not, um, but then of course not, not, not a resilient one. So the whole purpose of holographic consensus was to solve that problem and allow for decision to be made by small groups, so small amount of reputation, but in a way that guarantees that those decisions are actually in line with the global opinion, with what that would say if everyone would have been voting. And that's exactly the, that, that, that is the solution to the uh, tension problem of scalability and resilience. Can you go more into holographic consensus? I'm not sure what that means. That sounds like delegated reputation. Um, and that's what Menlo is trying to work on. Right, a reputation, but you have to. There has to be something at stake in the reputation, right? You have reputation to be able. It's also more of a liability than an asset, <laughs> really. It's begging to be gamed. The more the thing is with all these systems, the more you enter almost what's called the wet space of subjective interactions, the more likely it is to be gamed. Rather than something that's more objective, and reputation really falls under kind of subjectivity. Um, that's where I kind of get nervous with like DAOs and voting. Um, DAOs also suffering from collective action problems as well. Bring it down. But if you have more to lose, if you have more reputation, it's you're more likely to be a good actor. The question is what determines our reputation to begin with. Of course. Yeah. That's that's what I'm trying to sort of root out. Got it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just looking at you. I'm not sure. I, I, we can we can we can definitely dive into holographic consensus. I can describe how it works and why. I, I argue that it's not manipulable. So basically, you you are able to you are able to reach consensus in a very basically indefinitely small. Uh, consensus um, threshold, and then uh, and, and thus indefinitely high uh, decision capacity with full resilience. And just you tr you are, we are able to translate the tension between scale and resilience into economic problems. So if you are willing to pay a cost, you can com indefinitely uh, stretch scale and resilience. And but that that in order to do that, you have to introduce an additional network um, of predictors that basically. Kind of like you, you are, the, the reputation holders are outsourcing the navigation of the collective attention to a larger network, to an open market. But yeah, I'm just not sure if the format should be more like a, a talk or whatever. Like a conversation. So handing over the Matt, you're also welcome to join us in the circle <laughs> if you want. If you want to have an argument. If you want to, if you want to present about something, I mean, where? Well, what would also be useful is like, where does this sit with with DPoS, right? Like, what, like you're saying, like, it, like it's, it's sort very, of very different. Like, no, I, I'm not seeing an analogy to DPoS. I definitely see a, a strong analogy with holographic channels with uh, option computation. I can describe the analogy. Please do. Please do. Okay. okay. Do you do we need to use this puppy? Uh, I can describe the analogy and then I can can I use this thing? Um, yeah. So actually, I'll tell you about the protocol that we've invented in 2015. I think it was the first off-chain computation protocol. 
uh, it's very naive protocol. We have, we have just I thought about the idea, and then we we gave it the idea to um, Ethereum core developer, and he, he developed a prototype, and I think that was inspiring that drew it. And uh, but we we kind of like kept that idea, and, and eventually it took us a lot of time to understand how that idea translates into governance, and then you'll see the connection. So, how do you scale up computation naively in Ethereum? And for the example, let's think that there is no gas link, okay? For the sake of the example. So there is no gas link. So you can compute on the, on the blockchain as, as heavy computation as you wish. It just costs a lot. So let's say that you have a computation, you have, a, you have software, you have an application, and suddenly in the middle of the application, you have like this gigantic computation that requires, that is, that is costing, that, that costs, um, say, I don't know, half a million dollars, okay? So how do you, how do you um, compute it cheaply off-chain? So let's say that, of course, if you compute it on-chain, it, it, it will actually cost you half a million dollars. But let's say that there's a smart contract that you can you know, anchor on the chain, then you can ask people, what is the answer? This is my computation. Can you tell me what is the answer? And then anyone can come in and say, I, I've done the computation on my, you know, my, my laptop. It cost me you know, 20 cents. And I'm saying that the answer is five. But when he say, he's saying that, he's also putting a million dollar worth of ether locked on, 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 on the contract, stating that the answer is five. And then there is like a few weeks or maybe a few seconds, depending on, the, on, on your protocol. Uh, and then if no one has challenged that answer in that time, that time frame, then the, 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 the software continues as if the answer is five. But then, at any point in time, I can compute also that, co that, 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 that software, on, that program on my computer, and I can find that. Now, if I find that the answer, of course, is five, I cannot do anything. Um, by the way, I forgot to say, there's also, there's also a prize for that. Like, in order to make that computation, I can put some, um, some bonus that if nobody was challenging that, that answer five, he gets that bonus. Now, if I computed that on my laptop and I found that, that the answer is four, I can then claim the answer is four and also stake a million dollars. Once there is a challenge, now we will run, we'll actually run the software, the program on the chain. It will cost us half a million dollar, but someone is going to lose his money. Someone is going to lose his million dollar. He's going to pay for the cost of that uh, run, and then the other half will go to the winner. So you see, that's a very, very easy way to, of course, again, naive, gas goes, now, you know, now we can all ask a lot of questions and I never ask them, um, but I can just say that it's a naive way to think how, how you actually reach the same level of consensus in, in, in some sense by offering a prize and letting people um, maybe put a gigantic stake on them. Think, think that the stake is, is a death, death penalty, basically. You know, how many people will, will treat that? So that, that's the idea uh, behind it. Now, holographic consensus, okay, before going to holographic consensus, again, if we can dive into deep details with the, with, the, with the presentation if you wish. But before that, let me tell you, tell you something about governance. So the, the claim, governance is basically the subjective, uh, subjective cousin of blockchain. So also blockchain is a governance system, right? So people are making inputs. There is, there is machinery, then there is an output. In that case, the output is just the order of transactions, right? And that's just governance system, but the only thing is that blockchain is a governance system of, um, I would say, objective inputs by objective uh, agents transferring into objective, rea you know, ob objective outcomes, object objective realities. And objective realities are just transactions. So I call objective to things that the computer can verify and agree about. And a governance system is something that is the same thing for subjective uh, realities. So can we agree that something is nice, for example? That's something that a computer cannot verify, but human can agree about. So the claim is the governance system is basically the subjective analog um, of the blockchain. So putting that, holographic consensus is just a subjective analog of the game that I just described. And the, the difference is that the predictors, rather than staking money and saying that a certain um, truth that everybody can agree about is right, they're staking tokens and saying that certain thing will happen, but, or if you want, the DAO will decide about something, but that something is not, is not an objective truth, it's a subjective opinion, so it's, it's actually a prediction. It's not really a staking, it's not, 
it's not really you're staking on something that you know that is real or not, it's actually a prediction that you think that something will happen or not. How many people, how many people, how does that interact with like a prediction market similar to Augur being like the government system for a DAO, a scale for it's, that? It's very, very different from, so firstly the, the prediction game is completely different. There's no prediction market, you're not trading. Um, you're, you're willing to lose something. Right, it's a prediction game, it's not a prediction market. So that's firstly, and secondly, Prediction market that what's like, the incentive to play if it's not a market? And I'm just curious. No, you can make profits and you can you can you can lose stake, but you're not in not market in the sense that you're not trading your you know that in a in a prediction market you're trading their the, the answers. So if you lose the stake, is it dispersed amongst people who also bet it against it? Yes, correct. It's a prediction game, just like betting on horses. It's a prediction game. And then if you, if you want, I can read that, that in details and see how it works. Yeah, that'll be cool to see. Okay. More questions or? Uh, how does it differ from what Truebit is working on? It's completely different. Truebit is scaling up the blockchain. <coughs> so it's actually a second layer on the blockchain that allows you to scale up computation on the blockchain. Yeah, I'm talking about the off-chain computation part. Because Truebit does something pretty similar, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just wondering how you so those two things different? Um, well, I think, again, the, the, the game that I've described is just a naive game. There are so many problems. I, I started by saying that there, I'm assuming there is no gas in the It's already not, not a real game. It's just, just inspiration. But yeah, I, th I think Truebit was inspired by uh, Ethereum marketplace, uh, computation marketplace, and that's the mission of the game. Um, How do you create the systems of value on some things that the majority of people like, but what about, I don't know, like politics that, or like something that is kind of taboo, that there is uh, potentially large portions of this green idea. Can I actually right. pipe in on this? Yeah. I'm sorry. But um, so there's actually like 200 years of research academic research on like that topic. And it's called um, the theory of, of social choice and voting. And it's basically like a mathematical framework which tries to understand how like a number of people's preferences are reflected in the preferences of like society as a whole when they undertake like a decision or a vote or something like that. And like <laughs> In blockchain, I always, um, I always accuse like blockchain people of not of being like very gun ho, but like not paying attention to the bodies of work that have been, you know, studied for like hundreds of years, um, and this being one of them. Uh, so what, what that what that theory basically shows is like a lot of interesting, like very mathematical results about about governance systems. I'm totally not accusing, um, and. Uh, so like one example is something called Arrow's theorem, which basically says that if you make some very vanilla, like very reasonable assumptions about how those preferences translate from the like individual in the society to the, uh, to the, to the decision, um, then your governance system just inevitably collapses into dictatorship. Um, like things like that, like impossibility theorems, Arrows theorem. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, I just want to like put that out there because it's a really interesting topic. I have like about a year ago, I had like a tweet storm on, on this. And I post like a, it's a free like PDF book, 300 pages, which is a survey, and, like all the results in this field. And if you have like a basic understanding of, of math, like like undergraduate you know, uh, math courses, you probably need it. What is it called? Social what? Theory of so social choice and voting. So, yeah, I'm just completely falling asleep when I have a coffee. So, basically, <coughs> there are two forces that are acting in here, okay? Um, the thing is that anyone, 
people are used to think of fork as a bad thing, but I think fork is the, is the best thing. So at any point in time, so firstly, before speaking of fork, I think the good governance system of a DAO is one that constantly increasing alignment, okay? So basically, in a way, if, let's say that if I'm voting with the majority, my reputation, my voting power increases. If I'm voting against the majority, my reputation power decreases. And that sounds like not fair, like you're pushing out a minority constantly. And I mean, if maybe the DAO increases and more people are coming and it's more heterogenic, but then still, we're constantly pushing out people are, that are off majority and you know, pushing in people that are with the majority. But I'm saying that's fine, because once you are pushed too out, you're just, you have a good signal that you are not aligned with that DAO, and you have a greater increasing incentive to fork out, not fork out the blockchain, fork out the value system. You create a new competing DAO with a different value system where you are the, reputation, the main reputation holder, and then if other people are maybe also pushed out but they are aligned with you, they can migrate to your DAO. And gradually what's happening is that you start to get fractalization process where DAOs are, each branch in the DAO is becoming more and more coherent and every time there is too strong a coherence, people are pushed out and there is a, there is a fork and you get like a fertilization process, just like species basically. Um, and yeah, and, and what I'm trying to say is that that, that actually optimizes for coherence. Basically, if, if you have a too wide DAO, that there are people with too, too different opinion, that's not a good coherence. Um, and if you, if you have too many people in one DAO, basically there will be increasing incentive to fork. On the other hand, if you have too many forks, you have too little branches, and then you have increasing incentive to collaborate, so people will start collaborating. So you see, there will be a natural selection process and evolution, it will just drive to a, the just detailed balance between you know, too much collaboration and too much competition. I call it competition, and you'll just get like the, the, the tree of life of DAOs, of body system. So I think, does that answer what you? So in that case, you just have gained reputation through almost like a tyranny of majority. I mean, I, I'm standing not, not just, just to keep myself awake. Do you then gain reputation in a system where it's like a tyranny of majority? That's what it, sort of, that's what it sounds like. That's what my fair is a reputation element, right? So um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to understand the question. Let me try to see if yeah. I understand correctly. Say, well, you're saying reputation increases if you're with the majority. If you're constantly, yeah. I mean, if you're one time with and without, it will be average out. But if you're constantly with the majority, your reputation will increase and vice versa. If you are not constantly misaligned with the majority, but then because your rotation will go down, 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 you'll have increasing incentive to fork out the new value system. And maybe a lot of people will follow you. But it does sound like almost like isolated echo chambers in a way. It's not isolated echo chambers, just, it's just the, the fractal, because by the way, those, those branches are not necessarily competitive completely. Like they, they offer different view of the world, but they can also collaborate. But okay. if you're saying there's a minority that's forking out, they are in essence competing. Because they're they are competing with view of the world. It's a competing view of the world. Which is good, because there, it just means that there is another view that was hidden there. Now, of course, if, let's say, if we disagree about you know, football teams, but we agree about colors, okay? So, you know, maybe in that DAO that is trying to build code, you know, our disagreement with football teams and agreement about colors, kind of like average out, sometimes we agree, some will disagree about design, we agree. But if we constantly disagree about things, we should actually better for have to, I mean, we are hiding in that system, we're actually hiding two value systems. It will be optimized, like better coherence if we fork out and offer those two value systems separately. Yeah. So I think you just talked about tyranny and majority. And I think there, there could be a valid point. Like we, we, bring, we bring like gender. And like say if there's like a third gender and it's small, so how do they play, like what kind of role do they play if they're like a small minority? I don't know how it relates to gender, to be honest, but I no, think- No, no, like it, I'm saying, like you're saying like you're forking, I'm using it as an analogy of like, like the majority, it's like the majority, like say if you want equal rights or something, yeah. And but there's a, a bigger group that's probably not that that is sworn, mm -hmm. but it's not equitable or whatever you want to say, then what happens? I guess how do you coordinate voting across DAOs to have a coherent view of the world in questions that relate 
to specific people or individuals that are in different groups. Does that make sense? I'm not sure if that was not. Um, so, so, so actually, I'd like, I'd like to actually like, um, do you understand the question? I, it sounds like you're asking like if there's a minority, it sounds like he's asking if there's a minority like opinion that gets forked off. And this represents like a different view of the world, Correct. and yet all those people live in the same world and cooperate, and yet now they're on different fours, right? So how do they like collaborate or cooperate or coordinate? Or they, they can, like, they, yeah. those, two, those two view systems can be still participating in yet another value system, maybe a higher one, that is a more wider one. So for example, we can disagree well, about the colors. We can you can about own Ether and ETC at the same time, right? Yeah, but here it's much more, much more, much more clear. In, in, in blockchain, we don't see this trick. Let me give you an example. We are collaborating about um, about code, and we agree about the texture of code, like we have an application, but we don't we don't agree about the design. Okay. So, you know, if we if we are keeping ourselves just as one singular DAO, what's happened is either we are averaging our opinions and having like no consistent you know design opinion, or that one of us is just stronger and then oppressing the other one, right? But then we can invent new value, two value systems with, that, that believe in different designs. But they believe in the same technology. So they're actually running the same software with the same business model, and they have just two different interfaces. You know, one is better, what, you think that that is better, I think that that's better, and there are two groups who believe in that. That's fine. And there will be two competing products that will be competing at the interface level, but they will actually be agreeing in the technology level. And they even monetize that. Yeah, that makes sense. I have a question for you. What do you think like is going to be the like actual subject matter? Of, oh, well, here's what I mean. Like, how do you think people will actually structure blockchain governance systems? Like, what do you think the rules will be? Are they going to be the same as the ones we have in the real world? Are people going to I think come up with completely, completely new things? Completely new things. So, if I tell you about graphics, it's not similar to what we have in the real world. It's completely new. Things. Yeah. I mean, but like, like, can you give us? Can you paint like a picture of something? I mean, like, that can might happen. You, I mean, it's, is it is it legit to open that or to open a, a, a presentation? Yeah, do it. <laughs> um. Maybe after we start. I'm not sure if I need to restart that or that or one of them. Wait, let me let, let me. You guys can also grab tea or coffee over here if you want. All right, I think, I think I need to restart mine. Huh? What's happening? Oh. oh let me see which bridge. I have like several decks. Let me see. Uh, plug it. Yeah, no, I'm just choosing yeah. one. Yeah, okay. Matt, what time is it? And do you want to do a presentation? Or do you want to talk? Or you? Um, like, developers tools to make to make like dApps that people use. I feel like um, blockchain as a as as a thing as an industry has yet to produce um, much much substance. Right? There has hasn't been a lot very many useful things. Um, produced from yeah. blockchain technology. So, like, I, I, I very much agree that um, uh, DAOs are going to be the most impactful thing that our industry produces. Um, so, I'm very, very interested in, uh, as I think that you wind up with pract practical use cases, you know, or, or, or taking uh, something that is. You know, slightly inefficient uh, coders, coders debating the, the design patterns or the structure of a, of a code base, for instance, and you know, and, and using a DAO to scale. I think what's um, and wh where does where decentralization where decentralization provides benefit within these architectures? Because this can all be done on MySQL, you know, on a server somewhere. What's what I find really fascinating, like. The, the, the Pandora's box is, um, you know, where decentralization, where, 
when we remove governments, like what, what, what things become more efficient when we remove the restrictions imposed upon us by governments? And this is where, like, um, you know, Vidal from 2016 or 15 or whatever it was. Um, uh, so th that was an interesting use case because cro cross border uh, in in investing, like every every jurisdiction has their own rules and everybody has to obey them, and I think it really hinders technological development. So you, you know this is this is where blockchain and decentralization shine. So I'm super fascinated by sort of other use cases um, where decentralization plays a key role in um, its usefulness. I think curation is, is, is a great example. I think decentralized curation is just something that we haven't seen yet. Like we haven't seen it. We're going to change. It's going to change forever sense making the world, the way we make sense of things. And I think it's going to be so dramatic, no less than Google. So, so and just and to, and to drill into that a bit, would this be like uh, curation, curation such as um, a giant, uh, like a decentralized sort of open source Facebook where we, you know, uh, you can choose certain curators to decide like how many cat, cat photos from your friends is filtered, you know, or sort of, but right now Facebook is a curator, right? The mm, I'm, I'm, not, I'm thinking about something else. First, Facebook is not a collective curator, but, um, but, but yeah, it's hard though, and, and, and recently they just banned, you know, InfoWars, so in, in, in fact it is. No, no, no yeah, right. Curation. Right, right. I mean, I mean, curation in a broader sense. Like, I mean, curation in the sense of, look, I, I just want to eat in the best restaurant in this neighborhood, and I, by the way, I'm, I'm vegan or not vegan or something else, and 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 I like this dish, and, blah, 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 and then I just get like, okay, you just need to eat here, and that's it. Um, or it can be curation of like, I open my, my, my desk to, this morning, and there's like 10,000 articles on the web, and I just, but I have time to read one. And I want to know exactly what I specifically need to read this morning. And there is a curation engine that tells me what I need to read this morning. And the curation engine knows me better and better, and I know it better and better. But it's not someone, it's not holding somewhere, it's created by people yeah, that, that, that are like minded uh, with me. So, and, and more and more, I can give you many more examples, or, or even ICOs. We know shit like what, what, what a good ICO is, what a bad ICO. And this, this is an example actually. I mean, we were working with the theme about like, decentralized curation engine in general. And ICO is a great example. Like, so, so, so this is exciting and this is a really interesting use case for a DAO. Um, we, so we have centralized uh, so cur curation uh, marketplaces. Spotify is a great example, right? I can listen to in any number of people's playlists. Right, it's not, but it's not decentralized. It's not decentralized. It's not decentralized. So the thing is that it's not decentralized. It's corruptible. It's highly corrupted all the time, and it's not incentivized. So it's not incentivizing for curations. So people, when you do curation, you don't earn anything, and that's why, from the entire business cycle, the the one cycle that actually produces the value is kept out of the cycle, and that's why it's cheap. Once you in, 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 once you put into the cycle, the business cycle, also the curators. I think you get not 10x, like 100x. Pay, pay, pay paying, the DJ, paying the DJ, so to speak. Sorry? Pay, uh, paying the DJ for the value of their cur curation. Uh, Richie Hahn would get paid more for his curation in this case than uh, somebody else. I'm, so, so, yeah, so, sure, spot, like, and just to, dr to drill into like why decentralization, because I think that's like a really exciting uh, rabbit to chase. So, yeah, so Spotify is corruptible, but like, uh, you know who, who who cares if the Spotify administrator maybe you know alters a playlist because um, because there's nothing at stake, right? There's there's little to lose. But what would be some use cases where there's a tremendous amount to lose from corruption in the case of a, a, a type a thing that's curated? There is, I mean, there are tons of examples. I, I, actually, I think ICO is is a great example. I mean, if, if you've done through ICO, you know that. Every ICO has to work with uh, ICO rating platforms. Yeah. It's like like you, know, you have to. Yes. Now there, you know, in the old days, I remember there were like one. I remember the first one and two and then three. And now we have like three hundred. Um, now all of them are corrupted completely. Like you need to pay. You, you basically pay for, for rating, and the rating doesn't doesn't do shit. And the whole industry is 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 broken. So that's an example of how centralized. And the whole thing, the only thing that the centralized give you is alignment of interest, the right alignment of interest. And in the, to, 
ICO rating, it's a business today, it's completely broken. And, and it's quite amazing. It started like nearly a year and a half ago, and it was managed to grow 100x and broken, be broken in, in two years. That's, that's fantastic. Um, and you saw this with Investi. Investi. On one on one app. Well, the, what exactly were you talking about? Well, I see a rating sense. So, so, so this is actually a problem we're very directly so decentralized rating decentralized rating agencies is the simplest use case and will be a killer. Well this is like so the BTA should be a decentralized rating agency. It's trying to like Culver's trying to make it like FinCEN. He's trying to create it in a way that's a transparent, you know, no front running, blah blah blah. But he's trying to make it in such a way that we could all you know we could all join as members and then we would be a decentralized rating agency on a memo guild. Which is why you see it's so interesting uh, so, 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 I, so, I, so ICOs are like, so like the, the history of Menlo is we started solving problems around how do we make the transaction ICOs like better because that's, because it's, it's such a, it's such a shit show, you know? Um, and so it, it led us on the rabbit hole, like, well, what, what else, you know, what other types of, where, where there's like high, uh, high what other types of ecosystems are there where there's a, a, where there's a lot at stake and like and like high high value signals, right? So so you know, blindly trusting Ian Gleamer, for instance, uh, for his for his for his ICO reviews is, is like is like one example. And so you, you mean the site curation or generally for that one? Um, I mean, in in general, uh, I mean, and just its focus on decentralization. So you know, these are these are systems that like. Could be do done by a, a trusted intermediary. Like, hy hypothetically, um, you know, people could be voting on like you know, most people trust like like you know, like Google for the most part. Like people base their businesses on Google. Well, depending on what, yeah, but yeah. But like um, even China does now, right? I mean, they, they're issuing Google's issuing a censored version. Of it. Yeah, yeah, they've got like yeah. So, so but there's um like. Uh, so corroboration, I think is. Again, you are, if you think about within the domain of curation or generally for DAOs? I mean, gen, gen, um, uh, a, a practical use case for, for decentralized governance. And I like that you brought up curation or ICOs because um, ICOs are uh, a legal gray area in many jurisdictions, right? People are trying to uh, get rid of them. And in fact, at, you know, I, I, ICO, an ICO review, whether it's done by one person or by a DAO, could be seen as like financial advice and, and doling out financial advice in many jurisdictions is heavily regulated. So this is a thing where you know, the, the government said no and then and then technology and free market said actually yes. Um, so but uh, uh, I, I'm always just I'm, I'm super fascinated by any other practical use cases of that. Of course a bunch of like blockchain engineers, uh, blockchain architects so making ICOs more efficient is like is like the first thing that it's like the first thing to think of, obviously, right? It's like yeah. um, you know, I think that's also like a low hanging fruit. I think that's like a real use case of governance that has tremendous value instantly right now. Uh, that one, I mean, centralized management of funds. There is like tens of projects managing billions of dollars. They don't have any way to spend that money effectively. That's the way they can crowdsource spending that money. Thousands of, thousands of decision makers. They can spend money much more, faster, effectively. I think that's 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 a use case that's on the fa like on the face of it. Like, there, is, there is no solution right now to spend large money quickly and, and effectively. Scaling up organizations, scaling up decision making capacity is very very hard, very expensive. And that's the, the, so I think that's another use case. Um, it's a good use case. You can, there are more, but yeah. yeah. Um, I'm tempted to dive into sort of the, okay, well, uh, the implementation of these, of these systems on a technical level, because that seems to be like a, a, a serious uh, hindrance, right? This is all, it's, it's right. It's so, so, it's, it's, so here, are, are you guys finding this useful? You're awfully quiet over here. I don't know, let's see back back feed you have. Yeah, maybe more questions or um you were going you were about to kind of show your presentation. Oh, regarding the consensus system. Uh, 
So I can I can I can start that through the application, then then we go to actual technicalities. But just because here you you actually see, so it's easier to get the framework and then. That's alchemy. So I'll, that's the management, the fund manager. Just want to show, just want to show you something there, and then I'll, again I'll I'll write. This is this is alchemy. This is alchemy. This is alchemy. Um, so you see, there is just fun. Right now, the fund is just one inter. The, by the way, that's in the Kova network, but there is a version of the mainnet. Um, that's me. I hold such and such ether, such and such gen, gen token, which is like the network token, our network token. Um, and I've got just a lot of reputation in the system. It was designed so that I can make demos because I can make decisions on my own. Um, Does this work with MetaMask? That works with MetaMask, correct. And then anyone can open a proposal, so I can make a proposal, anyone, so that's like open, that's open for anyone. Anyone can go now on that URL and open a proposal, and I can summon a proposal, so maybe it's, it will be like a, a, a meetup, organizing a meetup uh, in pencil works, and the description is that, www. and just right now it's like the, minimal, the minimalistic version of that, so we, we scrap off like everything, print off everything that is not relevant, so I'm just going to, uh, pencilworksworks.com, that would be my URL that describes the proposal, and I'm putting in a beneficiary for that transaction, and I'm asking, again, here's like very minimalistic, I'm just asking what I want, I, I want 100 reputation score and maybe two ether, one ether, um, and then I just submit the proposal, and see, sign that transaction, and I confirm it, and now it's going to the blockchain, and soon it will be a, a post on the blockchain, there will be a new, a new proposal. So by default, every proposal is a regular proposal, okay? Now when I say regular, and that here I'm kind of like slowly getting into the graph consensus, when I say regular, it means that for sake of presidency, there actually needs to be 50% of all reputation holders saying yes on that proposal to be automatically executed on the blockchain, okay? So we call it a absolute majority. I need absolute majority to support my proposal. So, take some time. Um, so when you upload or download, does it, does it uh, require you to deposit? Right, so now, now there are two, so apart from, so it's, it's really, it's so simple. So apart from making proposals, there are just two things that I can make in that platform, two, two actions that I can make. So one action would be to vote. Um, I wonder whether it's the internet or whether actually I'm lacking gas. Maybe I should have put in more gas, I'm not sure. We'll see. Um, so I can vote for a proposal. So let me just move that for a moment. And also maybe refresh. I don't think that's, the, that's that. But we'll see. Um, so I can, oh, transaction complete. Great. Took another few seconds. I was not patient enough. I don't know if enough people know that, but most people think know that it takes time to write on the blockchain, but not enough people are aware that it actually takes more time to read from the blockchain. Um, and that's a big problem which I think Matthew is trying to solve. So basically you have to have good caching of the blockchain in order to actually make usable applications, and we do. We have a, that's actually the hardest part of the application is the caching layer. And what I think, what, is that, the way I understand Menlo 1 is that they are, they are doing centralized caching there. Which, we, which is definitely needed. So anyway, so that now we have the meetup in Pencil Works. So that's a proposal that now anyone can see. And there are two actions we can do right now. We can upvote or downvote it. So clearly I'm upvoting. And again, I will need to sign that transaction. When I'm upvoting, I, need, I don't need to stake any, any token, okay? In a way, by definition, I might be, I'm staking my reputation. I'm putting my reputation on stake uh, because I voted early. By the way, if you vote late, you're not staking your reputation. But I don't call it staking, I put it on stake, but I'm not staking in the sense that not, I don't need to, it's not a token, it's not transferable. I, I, the difference between reputation and tokens, of course, people say reputation is not transferable, but there is more core difference. The difference in reputation is that the DAO can take it down also. Token, nobody can take down your tokens, right? Nobody can take your tokens from you. Reputation can be taken and by, the, by the system. What, what signals define reputation? Sorry? Oh, what's, what signals, what social signals define reputation? You mean what triggers reputation flow? Uh, 
how how does a, what does a user have to do to earn reputation? Uh, so, are they uploaded? So, are they popular? Are they're, they're, so, proposals so, are so you can have a whole bunch of modules that define reputation flow. Um, one would be, for example, if you vote online with the consensus, you are going early, you're going up, down. Um, another one would be, I make a proposal, it becomes successful, approved, then I get reputation, and so on and so forth, and you can make more, more of those. So I'll show you the architecture afterwards, and you'll see that where you can plug in, you know, anything you want, basically. But these are kind of like popular examples. Could you, could you talk about boosting the proposal to Yes, the that's exactly the, the, next, yeah, the next thing. So then the second thing that I can do, so I can, I can vote up or down. You see, I, I voted up, and you see already that, 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 that something has been voted up. And then the second thing I can do, I can also stake gen tokens. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have gen tokens right now on this core network. That's unfortunate. But if I, if I did, I could have now staked gen tokens that is going to pass or that it's going to fail. Now, this, I don't, need rep I don't need any reputation for that. So any of you that can just buy gen tokens in the market and come and play that game. So you can stake gen tokens whether certain proposal is going to pass, approved, or going to be rejected. Okay? If you're going to make a good, a good one, you're going to make, make more gens. If you're going to make a bad one, you're going to lose your stake. Maybe entirely or maybe partially, depending on the protocol. So you are bringing predictions market on top of these proposals? Correct. It's, again, it's not a prediction market, it's a prediction game, but yes. Prediction game. Correct. It's a prediction Legal game about standards. proposals. But the difference from future king and that, you, the, the predictors are not making any decisions. The decision is only made by the reputation holders. They are just signaling for what they think will happen and you'll see why. Okay? Um, as part of the data stack, if I wanted to build a module that, let's say, connected with market? Correct. You can do that. Like do that. Very easy. Yeah. That you, you'll see that picture, you'll see uh, very easy. Perfect. Yeah. So did you in, maybe did that suffer from like abstraction of value? Because now you have a bounty on whether or not something to pass or fail <coughs> along with the value of the actual proposal itself to gain the proposal in favor of the actual game or you cannot game it. So so it's very easy because you just cannot game it. And you, you can you can only make profits if you signal something before it was clear. And in order to actually make it work, you need to you need to coordinate the entire reputation holder system, again, like the 51% of that, in order to gain profits. And you'll see, uh, you'll see in a moment, we'll get there, you'll see that if you're trying to gain it, you're actually increasing the incentive for something to flag you, for someone to flag you, and drag others to, to counteract you. Okay? It's actually trying to gain, that's, that's, that's anti-fragile system. Trying to gain a system actually increases the incentive for someone to flag you and counter after you, okay? So, um, once enough stake has been predicted, only once enough stake has been, and we'll get into the threshold and all that, but only once enough stake has been predicted that a certain proposal is going to pass, only then it's done, it's done boosted, okay? And these are the boosted proposals. Now, there are two differences between boosted proposals and, and, and regular proposals. The first difference, well, there's UI different that are sitting on top so that you can look at them better, and the next version will be nicer. But there are two real differences. The first difference is that boosted proposals are open for a short and time period. I didn't tell you, but those proposals are also open for a finite time period. So when I make a proposal, it open it up in this version for 21 days, you can the double configure that number. But right now it opens up for 21 days. If at the end of 21 days nothing happened, i.e. it was not boosted, and no absolute majority has been reached, it's being deleted from the, from the database, okay? However, this one is open for three days, so that's the first difference. The second difference is that this requires relative majority to be executed and not absolute majority, which means that at the end of these three days, a decision will be made, okay? Apart, out of all of the voters, the reputation holders that did vote, if majority says yes, it is a yes, if majority said no, it's a no, no quorum whatsoever. Okay, no core is needed. Thus, it's very scalable. So that system can, can produce a lot of decisions um, in a short time period. Now, and we'll get into the details again, we'll go over this, this slide in a moment, but now the thing is that there is a threshold, only I told you that only if enough stake was predicted and something is going to pass, only then it got boosted. But the threshold, that enough, is actually exponentially dependent in the number of proposals that are already boosted. So the more proposals are boosted, the more the collective attention is already diluted, the more someone needs to stake in order to yet again boost another one. 
No, it doesn't mean that he's paying that. Maybe it's thousand dollars, but he's willing to do that because he's very confident. So you see, if it was a payment, the first version of our product was payment. But then if it was payment, it means that when you make, this is like a protective algorithm because it makes like exponential, the, the threshold goes exponential with the number of open proposals, so it's very protective for the collective attention, right? The problem though that if it rises very fast, you again hit the wall of, um, of scalability because now, let's say the threshold now is on $2,000, only if, if making the proposal has an internal value to me worth of less than $2,000, sorry, more than $2,000, only then it's worth for me to actually make a proposal, right? Because every, everyone that makes a proposal has internal value from that, for making that proposal. Maybe it's zero, maybe it's $10, maybe it's $2,000, right? So only if the internal value is higher than what I should pay in order to boost it, only then it should more, would be worthwhile. But with staking, it's not the case, because maybe, um, you know, maybe the internal value is $10, but there is a, the confidence level the predictors, which are different actors, their confidence level that this thing will pass is so high that they, are feel, they, they feel free uh, to stake $1,000 uh, about that proposal that is going to pass. So then the, the, the extra that needs to be incentivizing them can be much, much lower than the actual threshold. Okay? So for example, if the threshold is $1,000, I can incentivize predictors with $100 to make predictions to stake $1,000 that is going to pass, if they think that the, 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 the odds that we're going to pass is larger than, is better than 1 to 10. You see the, the math? And we, we'll, we'll go over it again, so don't, if you don't, don't worry. Um, Are you guys catching this in a meaningful way? Yeah. This is just like getting in the context and then I, I can go over the slide and see really the details, but I, I just want you to remember that when we do that. Or if I'm completely losing, uh, track, please let me know. Like, or if I'm just boring you, that's all. Awesome. Awesome. How, how much time do you have? What time is it? 835. Jeff, Matt, do you want to weigh in on this? I'm just kind of having fun because I, I built the first UI for this thing. And it's, uh, it's, it's nice to see how, how, like, how evolved it is and the smooth. I'm just kind of doing it. I'm just taking in like, the smooth W3, Web3 integration that you guys did all the custom UI stuff. It is kind of. There is incredibly a lot of work in here. I, I, I was completely surprised at how much work in, in, in here. Like, it took us way longer than we thought. I mean, like, I mean, so, like, the, 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 there's so much theory here. You know, like, the imagination runs wild with the input, uh, with, 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 like, how this could be applied to, to practical, real world use cases, right? So, we're, People are staking tokens to boost their proposal, which is ultimately attention, right? It's at the yeah, top, so it's, it's, they it's get more. It's, it's yeah. an attention thing. So, um, I mean, a system could be built for um, uh, solar versus the big oil, right? And 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 a, a, a voting mechanism as to whether like we should just like ban oil. And then, or like the, the solar industry says, look, they put a proposal like we should ban oil, and this is on YouTube, and people are staking tokens to be to boost their proposal, so it's at the front page of YouTube as opposed to buried in search results or something. So like, the when you start applying like actual real world use cases to this, it, it kind of fires up the imagination. And, and I was thinking about a, on a total micro level of growing up with two sisters and my parents, and the fact that we always would vote on family trips and what we want to do. And actually having actually applying this to families, and, and actually having proof that I actually had a voice in what we did, and actually taking creating a value system so that we actually were still, we still we actually had to stake things and, and actually make it real. You can actually do that. So you can actually take this on a micro level and put it into a literally into a family situation. You can put it into a, a company situation because you know inside of a company sometimes the executive team. Or even the broader team needs to make certain de certain decisions actively, uh, res retroactively, proactively. Sometimes you need the entire team, the entire company to opt in and have a voice spoken. And you know, we have leadership. We have a thousand people in the company. Sometimes they're looking for direction. <coughs> you can actually apply all your principles on on that on a micro level there, and it works. And frankly, with a family of five, it also works. Particularly if you're putting your allowance, if you're staking your allowance, you're doing other things, 
as a way to get your voice heard, where the promise is that you get what you want, as opposed to saying that you never know what's going on because you're always left out. This is proof that you were never left out in the decision. You may not get what you want, but you at least are aware of what's happening. So as you're speaking on a, on a macro level, you know, I'm thinking on a micro level, on how this could be used in ways that you never thought about, but could be as effective, if not more effective, because you could distribute this to, to lots of communities, lots of people, and, and if, we're if we're growing up in a blockchain-influenced world, I mean, you can deal with the bigger issues, but also meaningful issues. And what's meaningful is not necessarily the same to everybody. I want just, and I would just want to emphasize, like maybe just to not lose the the north star, like not lose the, the you know, what we what we came. No, no, but I was applying. I was. No, oh, sure, sure. I'm just saying, like, what I just want to remind you, like, what was the problem that I want to solve here? Just, just so that you have that, like, in in, in your background. R right now, it's not very interesting. Just like, I mean, it is interesting, of course, but it's just but like. Were you in the, were you here. exploring in the tie-in? Sorry. Were you exploring in the tie-in? Were you in the E two hundred unit? So I, I were you in the 8200 unit? 80? 8200. Oh, if I was in it, now I understand. No, I was a completely different unit. Ah, because friends of mine could, could have benefited from this and just helping them make decisions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I just want to say that now imagine that's not an organization of 30 people as it is right now. That's an organization of 30,000 people or 30 million people. Now the list over here, and of course it will have different UI, but the list over here is not a list of four proposals, it's a list of 4,000 proposals. How do you make sense of that? Right. That's, the whole, that's the whole point here. There is an army of predictors, maybe you know, thousands of people in India or Africa or South America or Europe, or they're out there, they, put, they put, make put, money. You could put that on the two billion people on Facebook and use that as a way to actually get rid of fake news, or use that as a way Correct. to actually... Correct. But how would you, how would you get those people who are voting tokens who don't have wallets? Well, yeah, here you need them. You need those people who have wallets, of course. Memo one, Memo of course, one. what? <laughs> but 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 I'm just saying that you have tons of people who can make easy profits from just participating in that game. Right, bounty. But actually, then, the bounty OX has been doing very well for people in this. Right. But, then, that, but these are not even techie people, they're just people who understand social context and can make predictions about, and you know, even if they have some better than 50% odds, they can make predictions and make profits, and by, by that you can outsource the navigation of the collective attention through those thousands of proposals into a, a, a crowd, a cloud of predictors, and by that you can actually make effective decisions at scale. So you can make maybe 100 decisions a day. And, they will be a good decision because the whole purpose of the prediction network is not to decide what should happen. It's to decide what will happen, what they think that repetition holders <coughs> eventually, because only repetition holders eventually decide. But uh, then I can go into this and show you why, why it actually solved that problem. Um, but I want to ask, like, honestly, like, who is really interested to be into that? Because if, if we don't have like a majority of really interest, so maybe if it's just two of you interested, we can maybe continue and then like we can spend time. What do you think? Well, afterwards. yeah, that's probably best. Who's interested in what? I mean, I'm just moving forward and learning more. Like, who's interested to dig into the whole graphic consensus details? But only, only if we have majority of that, I think. We have local majority or global <laughs> majority. Take it. Okay. Yes. Then we can go. Okay. Um, okay, so we're graphing on Zeno scale, but now this is just uh, come, coming from a, a, a conference, DAPCON in Berlin, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I will run through the thing that you know, but th this is trivial, but I just want to make it clear. We want to have decentralized government system, so decentralized meaning wide distribution of power. We want it to be resilient, so resistant against manipulation, but I will make it more precise. We want to make it scalable, so we can grow, forget about a super, we'll do it another time, but we can grow it effectively so that we can run, as the organization grow, we can also make more and more decisions effectively, okay? So blockchain governance is basically taking the input of, for example, a proposal, it doesn't have to be, by the way, a proposal, but that's just one example, the proposals and the inputs of an agents, we run it through the system, we get an output. That's the governance system, okay? By the way, just for techie part of you, this is the ARC, this is the DAO stack, the ARC framework of governance in DAO stack, um, what you see, this is the, la the language of governance. What you see over there is the bits 
of do's. You know, if such and such happened, do such and such. And then you have like library of, of bits of do's. These are the bits of don'ts. No matter what happens, don't do that, like in the Bible. Every, every government system can be broken into do's, do's and don'ts. And that's what it is. And then the controller picks up, like you, the user are, inter are, are interacting with the do's. The controller picks it up. If there is a trigger, it checks the don'ts and then activates the actors. The actors, in this case, is the token printing of this agency, the reputation system of this agency, and the avatar, which is the, the face of that agency, that can do anything else in the blockchain. So that agency can vote as a single agent in another agency, or in Aragon. That agency can open a company in Aragon, for example. So the full interoperability is possible. I think someone has been asking me about Ogre. You can completely yeah. integrate that with Ogre, okay? okay. Um, and now when you come, when we, when we speak with a partner to build an organization, we are breaking their, their, you know, their needs. Jake, it was like it's super pleasure. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Okay. So basically you, you break the entire what they want to achieve, you break into modules eventually. And then we, we go back to our library, do we have those modules? 80% of the time we have them. And then 20% of that time we have a new cool module, we're building that too. Then we have a growing library of modules that we can combine and make organizations. By the way, part of the laws here are the laws to change the, the rules to change the rules. So you can activate changing, subscribing new modules or unsubscribing existing models. Okay? The center of governance is a consensus protocol between subjected agents with the subjected inputs reaching the regular center thread. As we said that, an example of these decisions will be allocation of resources, metadata, such as curation, the governance system itself, and there are more. Um, reputation just to be on the same page. It's just a numerical division per, per agent. It's not transferable unless you decide to make it transferable under some restricted conditions, and we have that these options too. So it's not a token, and it amounts to influence or voting power. Can you yes. can you port your reputation from Menlo into here? That's a really good question. So interoperability of reputations. So right now we are, we have not worked on that, but it's definitely possible. That's easy to do, but we haven't worked on that. That's that's a in, very interesting feature to come. Also, to port from one DAO to another DAO, right? Right, right, right. That's, that's basically the question I have as well. Is if, like, the reputation is, if it, it's an attestation, so like, you, if you go with the minority, if it's still a test that you go to the minority, it builds itself into a new, a new DAO. So, so the reputation, as it's defined in here, is just literally your voting power in a certain value system, in a certain DAO, in a certain agency. So if a new agency wants to import your reputation into it, it can. Or maybe it wants to import your reputation from five different DAOs that it trusts, weighted with some weights that, it, you know, that capture the trust of agency to agency, and then, and then seed your new reputation in this, this agency. You see? That's very easy to do. I see that could be becoming like a little dangerous, though, if your reputation is being able to cross DAOs simply because if your reputation is based on your signing with the majority in a particular DAO. No, so it's always, it's always by the decision of the DAO. So it's not like, like it's not it's not like automatically like if, if I make a new DAO, I can say, well, I need to have my initial reputation distribution. I'm not sure how to do that. You know what? I trust that DAO that trust in the sense like I'm, I'm pretty aligned with those five DAOs, five agencies. I will I will basically copy paste the reputation systems weighted by some some parameters and that will be my initial distribution, for example. But that's because I just choose that. It's not like you see what I'm saying? Yeah, as long as there's influence choice of influence over like where it comes from. Yeah, it's completely by choice. Um, and then we can talk about reputation flow, but I'm jumping over Is there a concern about the early DAOs having like undue waiting on future DAOs that are poured from them because of the matching of value systems over time? Like towards some sort of group DAO? Like should I be a large reputation holder in the first you're, DAO so I can- You're asking if there is a not dangerous, but yeah, if there is an early mover advantage. Yeah, in reputation over time. Uh, uh, it's a complicated question. I would yeah. say that it's a complicated question. I would say that to some degree, yes. Okay. It's a fair answer? Yeah. Um, so what is the biggest problem? Governance. I thought the biggest problem was actually accountability. Not scalability. Uh, you, you, you I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say accountability. I mean, you can break accountability by, you know, you want to invest $100,000 in a company? No problem. You can invest another 20 milestones and have juries to condition, you know, 
basically conditional our resource allocation to solve that. Yeah, but that's why the DICO is so interesting as a concept, right? Because there's, there's sure, then there's but DICO is just a module. DICO is just this one one module in that. Sure. Yeah, yeah. There are different ways to solve accountability. I don't think it's an issue. Hmm. Or like, I mean, it, to be honest, it was not even new. I mean, Vitalik was pop, was popularized that, but it was a known feature. For for those who work on this, it was a known feature. Implementation the top one. Sorry. Uh, implementation. So, I mean, you know, you know we're talking about you know, uh, 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 reputation, portability, interoperability. Like, how do we get? How do how do we get to? My phone is like constantly. Um, don't don't do an ICO. Your phone just keeps going off all the time. But you know, so so uh, you know, how do you? Get, there, there's like there's a classic joke, like you know. There's like a bunch of engineers and and there's like there's like five protocols and then some and then some engineer says how about we have like a protocol that just for one protocol that just does everything and then like the next frame is like the, and then there's just six protocols and it's like um, it's it's really hard to um, um, uh, uh, implement systems that serve in, in such a broad set of use cases and to get, and we're all, we're, all, we're all talking about governance and stuff, ironically, like it is hard to get, you know, groups of engineers to agree on, you know, like the, the pizza toppings, let alone like how to, you know, as like a, a, a protocol for, um, for, you know, for, for, uh, for, for data, how many, how many formats of text files are there, right? There's like thousands. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm, but look, you can you have an example of Ethereum itself that is having a great network effect on our ecosystem. So I'm not saying, and it's not the only one, but I agree that standards are, you know, standards and interoperability are important. I don't think it's the bottleneck to DAOs in any sense. Um, this is the biggest problem because this is a bottleneck to DAOs. There are no DAOs because of that, of that problem, it's simply as that. There are, like, if you try to do DAOs without that, they will not work, period. That's as simple as that. It will not work because either it will be uns unoperational, you will not be able to scale it down beyond like 20 people, or you will get, or 200 people if you wish, or you'll get a DAO that's just completely manipulable. So either, either of the two. So that's, that's, a, that's a problem, that's a battle, okay? That's, that's why I call it the biggest problem. Because if you don't solve that, you, don't, you have zero DAOs, that's it. And any other problem that I know, you can bypass, you can have like such, not, Ultimate DAO, you can you know, you have problems, but you can you can work it out, and that's why well that's why Alchemy I think will be the first mini dwarf DAO. Sorry, DAO platform. Sorry, um, but that's the biggest problem, which is the port. So before saying the problem, let, let me tell you the language. So what what do I mean by scalability? I said that before, being able to scale up decision making capacity by scaling up the number of participating agents. So more agents participating in DAO means more agents proposing proposals. But then also being able to scale the number of making decisions that you make in a unit of time. So if you have 100,000 people, and thus you have 100,000 proposals in a month, you also need to be able to process 100,000 proposals in a month. That's as, as is, right? Simple, simple as it is. Everyone agree with that statement? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, so resilient, so let's define resilience then. The global, you have a global opinion of the DAO, which is, the result of a decision, assuming the situation where all agents in the system had the sufficient capacity of attention to look at the proposal, to think about it, and express their opinion. 100% of participation, of engagement. That's what I will define with the global opinion of the DAO. Okay? Yeah. Is there any type of identity checks or like protection against bots or stuff like that? So we an identity, that's a great question, so identity, social identity um, integration is another feature actually that doesn't exist right now and will be existing in the next feature integration, but... How do you but, have civil resistance? Right, that's what I'm saying. This is internally, inherently civil resistance, so you don't have to have it, but it's a nice to have. So it's just because when you start, when you enter the DAO, you have no reputation, so you cannot manipulate the system in any way. You need to earn reputation by doing valuable contributions. And then if you do that valuable contribution in two agents, or one agent, it doesn't matter, you get the same reputation. So at the end of the day, you, you, not, you just cannot get more reputation by having more agents. But you have more agents all of equal value. You can affect the long range, yeah. Yep. 
No, sorry? Like if I had 10 bots all voting the same way, so they all were part of the No, trade. no, no, because the, their impact is the same because they're, they're, if, they, if the 10 sure, bots... But they then gain reputation over time and then... Well, so that's what I'm saying, it's not, it's not the angle. So the, taking one, one agent with 10 reputation score or 10 agents with one reputation score each, you will not be able to get more reputation by having 10 just not, but, don't, you but not those ten will effectively gain reputation over time. So you have like an all. Well, just as much as you could have, around, only if they make contributions. Yeah, if, I'm, if I have my ten accounts and they're each making contributions <coughs> and siding with the majority, they eventually gain reputation over time within that DAO. But I'm afraid it's not limitable. So you can, they cannot gain reputation over time. But, only but, if they make valuable contributions to the DAO. But if they're participating like, with noise and some of them are going to be losing money because they're. Gonna so be it's designed such that if they participate with noise, they just lose reputation over time. That's, that's the point. Of Well, if the set of bots was each was like a point of noise, some of them will inevitably thrive by accident. No. Right, and some of them will die. Some but you need to you need to make contribution. Real, in order to see the vendor reputation, you need to make them actually you know real contributions, such as making a proposal and getting it approved. But you could have, at the same time instead of making it with ten, you could make it with one. I'm trying to say that there is like completely simple insensitive. Got it. That a single individual participating solely on one account will inevitably move faster in reputation than. I would say no slower and, and, no. and, and possibly faster. Okay. Um, so resiliency will be defined to be decisions that are made in line with the global opinion. That's the definition of, the, of, of, of resiliency. Yeah. So, so basically, um, anything else will, will be manipulable. But more importantly, anything else, the decision will not reflect what the DAO actually thinks. So that's, that's the definition of the, the fact that the decision are reflecting the, the, the majority. And then you just hit the principle of attention. So too much attention on each decision, i.e. global decision, makes governance not scalable by definition. And then too little attention on each decision, i.e. local decision, or defi defined to be global decision, makes governance not resilient, period. By definition, both. Do you, do you see that? Or should I go over it again? Okay. It would so definitely be just kind of like a balancing on other side. So, so, I, I, so I would say that you cannot balance, so quorum try to balance that. I would say that they are balancing with that to the situation that firstly, you don't know how to change it, but more so you get to a situation that you are not scalable and not resilient at the same time. It's actually not, you're not guaranteed to have a sweet spot. And most time you don't have a sweet spot. Um, and that's the problem of any consensus. In fact, that's exactly the problem of blockchain itself. Okay? Blockchain also has communication speed, which makes it more severe on one hand, but then it's more severe on this, on this because it's attention of people and not attention of computer, which is much more limited. Okay? So a decentralized, resilient, and scalable government system has to allow for local decisions for sake of scalability that are guaranteed to be in line with the global opinion for sake of resilience. That's, if you understand that, you understand it all. By definition, again, a decentralized, resilient, scalable government system has to allow for local decisions that are guaranteed to be in line with the global opinion. That is the way to scale, that is the only way, in a sense, to scale up governance. And that's by definition of programming incentives. A decentralized government system that allows for local decisions that are guaranteed to be in line with the global opinion. Now, I need to tell you how that can be possible. I just, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do, so far I didn't do anything, I just, I just played with words. Now I just say, how is it possible to make local decisions that are, in fact, guaranteed to be in line with the global opinion, although it was not expressed? Right? If you, like, there is the... the just checking that I'm not late, late on my flight, that's all. So. There's the chaos theory, for example, that when you look everything from outside, it looks like a chaos, but if you go in the micro perspective of each thing, they are functioning in organized systems, and that creates like a huge web that um, sometimes, uh, somehow it work with the, with the whole picture. So you were saying that some, um, Some, how do you call it, protocols or 
some some of the consensus, like um, like what you just said before, that uh, some of the proposals that are before, if they early adoptions. Start, uh, yeah, the early adoptions. Mm -hmm. If all of this uh, small hives, let's say. small hives that are organizing each other by working and creating those branches, as you said, if they were being seen in the micro perspective, there's no way for them to communicate with each other and maybe create uh, a consensus um, among all of them, but that they would be driven by the small things, like like he was saying about the family, you know, how uh, something that has a big um, use could be uh, implemented in a micro perspective, and then tons of micro perspectives would create a consensus. By allowing yeah. in the fragmentation, by allowing each little group to do what they want, somehow it would work in the theory yeah. of chaos, then yeah. there's a harmony towards for the, the, the harmony the comes opinion. the harmony comes from the fact that what I try to describe with like the equilibrium between forking and collaborating. So so all of these little high or little agencies themselves will be agents <coughs> in other higher agencies. So in order will merge yeah. at, all, at all scales. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. Yeah, I think that, that... But that doesn't work for... Uh, is, isn't that scalable? Oh, now I understand. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's, in fact, our Did first solution. question? Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Tell me if I understand correctly. This fractalized system of agencies, right? Agency of agencies of agencies of agencies, that is that is a solution for scalability, yeah. correct? Yeah. That's that's that was our solution for scalability for, for like two and a half years. So you're on you're, you're spot on. Um, I can argue that it's not good enough. It's like great, but it's not good enough because well, I can give you an example. For example, this well because it's it's not. I mean, it's it, it is good, but it's not dynamic because. Agencies will not change fast. See what I'm saying? Yeah. This changed instantly. This kind of like, like, like that, do that. So I'm, I'm not saying that one agency will rule them all. Like you know, we just everything will be just under. I, I, definitely, what you're saying will happen, but it's more on a different time scale. It will like, like it's kind of like the scalability solution on a larger time scale, and this is scalability solution on smaller time scales. That's that answers. Yeah. Yeah. How does this still from, uh, machine learning. Sorry. That's a great question. That's that's a community learning. That's that's it's it's it's, it's philosophically I see some. I mean, I, I'm not an expert of machine learning, um, I, but from what I know, I, it seems to me like related in the sense of you're you're kind of like teaching your community to better yeah, to better process. Yeah, it's like community learning. You're teaching agents, but not vectors. You're teaching like actually you. you know, Increasing alignment is like analogous to better, better machine learning, right? Can we dive into your second question? Yeah. Uh, you said that you were about to. Yeah, so, so holographic consensus allow for this local decision that are guaranteed to be now in global opinion. Alignment is acquired, that's like the magic. Alli alignment is acquired by cryptoeconomic incentive to discover off and protect from misalignment. Okay, and I will show you how it works. But basically, you're just creating a second layer cryptoeconomic game, and that will be the prediction network, that whenever there is a mismatch between what's going in the local and what's supposed to be happening in the global, someone can make profit from identifying that mismatch, from calling out that mismatch, and staking against it. So by, and the more the mismatch is, the more the mismatch is risking you, the higher the incentive is. So it's kind of dynamically, and the is, there, is there room for AI to, to go in? Yeah, absolutely. So many places you can put the AI. Some are more, more cool, some are more frightening. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. But that's really scary. <laughs> yeah, correct. Um, yeah, why holographic? Because in the hologram, each piece of the picture captures the entire information of the three-dimensional image. So here, it enables you to probe, like, you know, a slice of the voters, but actually get the inside of the entire system. Okay? Uh, that's why holographic is this. So the prescription, that's like really like high-level prescription. So default, is, and now that's why I showed you the application. So default, default proposals are only accepted by absolute majority, but then there is a second different stage, which is basically boosted proposals, and they can be approved and executed by relative majority. Now, there are these people predictors, but anyone can become predictors, so it's an open network. They predict to place predictions and stake on the outcome of proposals. You've seen that, right? I, I, if I think that that proposal is going to pass, I'm staking you know, 1,000 gen on it. I think I'm going to fail. Oh, I didn't say that. People are not staking. So firstly, people are staking positively, OK? If I think that just crappy proposal, nobody looked at it, I think it's bad, I don't, I don't know anything, OK? So there are like 1,000 proposals, ah, thousand proposals on queue. And then the first kind of predictors are those who are screening them and looking for, say, oh, I, I believe in that one. I'm willing to stake some, you know, some fund that will pass, okay? The fishermen. Then once enough stake was put, then it's going to boost, boost it, but then there's a period of time where now the challengers are called on. Now another, pre <coughs> well, same predictors can now, instead of looking at 10,000 proposals, they can look at 100 proposals that just got, got boosted, for like, that's say 24 hours, and challenge those so maybe someone tried to hide the system and you know put stake and buy a decision. So now I can I can look. No, I I don't think that that decision is going to pass. I'm going to stake against that. Okay. Uh, and I have a question. Why do you? What's the distinction that you make that it's not a prediction market? It's a prediction game. Why? So it's just it's just normal nomenclature. Usually you say prediction market to something that. People purchase the answer yes and purchase the answer no. It's a token, and they trade it in the market. That's usually what people mean by prediction markets. But this is more like a betting game rather than prediction market. But it's it's similar, and more so, you know, let me be frank, there are other versions that I'm developing of holographic consensus where actually the prediction game becomes a prediction market. So, whatever. And then, whoever's taking, Whoever's joining, sorry, whoever's betting that it's that a certain decision is going Challenging. to pass, is never going to be the person voting. No, it's it's it can be the same person, but you're doing it with sim, sim, I mean, you're staking with tokens. You are voting with reputation, so you can stake. So you see, the staking community is much larger. Some people have reputation, but anyone can stake, right? So there are more token holders than reputation, generally speaking. Because that's an open network, permissionless. That's not an open. That's not it, a permission. Are there uh, protections against kind of having the having proposals that having some <coughs> kind of interest in something passing because you are of course, of course, there? of course, of course, of course. That's 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 like the basic attack vector. Like so, I, what it, what are well, I think if I complete like another one slide and a half, I think it would be easier to answer. But basically, I will need to collude with the entire network to actually make a profit from that, if I understand correctly your concern. Okay, good. Go ahead. So, so, yeah, so proposals are now boosted, becoming from absolute majority, only upon sufficient positive signals. Only if su sufficient stake has been put on them, only then they are being boosted. So in a way, the voting system outsourced the navigation of the collective attention to an economically driven predicted network, and the decision was still made only by reputation holders. So there is a complete separation between predictions and voters. Voters are saying what they think should happen in the DAO. Predictors are predicting what they think will happen, or what they think will happen, will decide by the reputation holder. There's full separation. That's what makes it Brazilian, basically. And that's how it looked like, and that's coming back to the application you've seen. So you see, there is a queue, like infinite queue of, 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 of regular proposal that requires absolute majority to be executed, and voters can say yes or no with reputation, and there is like ongoing in in incoming stream of proposals. Now predictors can stake gens about the outcome of proposal, first the fishermen saying yes, but they're passing, 
And if sufficient has been passing, then say no, then the challengers. Only if enough uh, positive signal in terms of positive stake has been put in the proposal, then it's been boosted, and those, the little letters there, with exponential dynamic threshold. So the, th the, the threshold of state that needs to be put on, on the table needs to be exponentially dependent on the number of proposals that's already boosted. And then once it's boosted, it's opened up for a short period of time, uh, um, and then relative majority for approval, and there is also quiet ending. So if at the ending of the voting period, the, 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 the answer was changing, then it's extended. You have to have a quiet ending period of time, otherwise that that's basically blocks an end of time task. So you can't, you can't uh, stake on a proposal that is Right, so at the end, you're always taking that, that period of time. But I, I would tell I mean, there are different versions of the protocol, and some versions can actually stay also later. It depends. It's, it's a long discussion, but yeah, yeah, you can make different versions. It's not like I'm trying to distill between principles and details of protocols, because holographic consensus is like a concept, like blockchain is a concept. Once you understand the concept, you can design many different protocols that satisfy the concept. So that's the, that's the detail. Um, one really important thing is that you have to have a bonus, like a, we call it DAO bounty, that comes from somewhere. Either the DAO puts it as like governance costs, or it's it's a portion of the incoming stream from the utility model. Um, because otherwise, there is no reason why predicts will come. If I'm a good predictor and I identify great proposal and I say yes, and then it's actually great, so nobody bets against me, then it actually works then I will not get anything, because if, if it's a zero-sum game, I will not get anything, and then I will not stake to begin with. So you have to have an, an asymmetric game, a bonus, and a, a bounty that only positive predictors, successful predictors eventually share. That's, that's your, and the ratio between that to the threshold will tell you how confident the predictor should be in order to make predictions. You see that? Yeah. Okay? So that, Bounty should correspond then to the size of the queue. So, so what I'm saying that that bounty is also dynamic and going to, going to, going to run as a function with function of the queue and things like that. Yeah, would that vary though from like decision to decision duration? That's a great question. I mean, this is like very baby version, and there are so many things we can like each each piece that I'm telling you about. Is like a research, like a PhD research. You can bring twenty different variations and play and AIs and and machine learning and whatnot. And you're building a toolkit, and then people will right be able exactly. To and and my goal was to put one complete protocol that is resilient to significant attack vectors. It's not optimized. It's like each of them you can like run infinite experiments, and that's why you need the DAO stack to. Because otherwise, you'll need to tweak so many things so fast and so rapidly, and then there will be economic evolution of organizations, those who have good protocols <coughs> will win, and you need to be able to change your protocol like that. So that's why you needed to break everything into, into tiny pieces. But that's, that's a great question. Have you experimented with um, dynamic bounties such that they scale? We haven't experimented with anything. This is all there is already. It's coming. The first experiment should come out this week, I think, or next week. Oh, amazing. So you're welcome to participate. You just ping me and we'll add it. Give a quotation. Please. Um, yeah, so that's, we're almost done. I want to prove to you, prove to you, and if you're a mathematician, you, you, you'll smash me with tomatoes, but I want to prove you, like, I'm a physicist, but I've, I've introduced myself, sorry. I, before doing blockchain, so I've, I've been doing blockchain for the past four and a half years, probably roughly that, but in different versions, and before that I was a physicist. So I did, I did my PhD and postdoc in postdoc in string theory. Um, and then I discovered the blockchain and I basically put that kind of thing. So this is a physicist proof, okay? So not a condition proof. Um, let's, I, want to, I want to prove to you now that the local decisions are actually in line with the global opinion. That was my claim, right? So that's, here's the proof. Um, let's say that the proposal is not in line with that global opinion, okay? So if, it not, if it's not in line, either it was not boosted or it was boosted. If it was not boosted, 
and thus it can only be approved with relative majority. Sorry, sorry, it cannot be approved with relative majority, and thus if it was approved, it was approved with global majority, and by definition it's in line with the global opinion. So far, so good? That's the easy part. Now, if it was boosted, it means that someone has put a, you know, a big stake saying it's going to pass, and then there was a big economic incentive for someone else to say, no, it's not going to pass, right? For the challenges. So it has been boosted, then there is an economic incentive to put a stake in a test that this policy is not in line with the global opinion. So there is, there is incentive, economic incentive to say, no, this is not in line with the economic incentive. With the, with the, so as long as the, someone in the prediction network knows what the global opinion is, he has, he has the incentive to stake against that, right? Anyone. Now, and that's, now it's, so that's kind of like almost the proof, but now, now the, the subtle part. The boosting threshold, and thus the economic incentive to stake against the boosted proposal, is exponential in the number of already boosted proposals. But the number of already boosted proposal amounts to the dilution of the collective attention, right? Or to the extent that the global opinion is approximated. So let me break that sentence down to, you know, to smaller. So, so basically, let's say that we let's say we have four boosted proposal. So rem remember again, my definition of global opinion: everyone has the capacity to look at the proposal. So let's say there are just four proposals in, in, in line in the boosting, right? So would you agree with me that we have a global opinion? That just four, the, the entire DAO is just looking just on four proposal for the rest of the week. So I would say that roughly there is a global opinion, right? I mean, if you don't vote, probably you don't care. But you have the time to look at you know, each proposal. So you have a global opinion. Now what about six? Is that like a global opinion or not a global opinion? So say, well, some attention is diluted. I'm not sure I have the time to look at six proposals a week. So. Well, but then, but then remember, because it's exponential in the number of proposals, there is exponentially, it, it rises really fast. Stake was put in order to boost a, yet another proposal, right? But then there was exponential incentive, exponentially more incentive to call for challengers to challenge that fact. So someone has challenged that. But now see the point. <coughs> Once I've challenged that, I have skin in the game. Now I have the incentive, the predictor that has been doing the challenge, if I see that the process goes to an approval, because they, you know, they're trying to kidnap, now I have the incentive to call out the voter and say, look, there is a kidnap here. Come vote. Now what if it's 20? Well, 20 is a you know, significant exclusion of attention, of course. Definitely not everyone can look at 20 proposals a week. But then there is like a normal stake on, on the table, and then the challenge, no, normal incentive to challenge it, and then a normal incentive to call out voters to, 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 to fish the, the glitches. It seems like to me this, the, 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 there's like a whole mid-range of like semi-boosted proposals that will arise that only exist for bots and like intel, like artificial intelligence that will, um, can participate and actually comb through the thousands of them and see where there's economic incentive to play almost like a spread of proposals. Can, can you break that apart into a small? Yeah. I, I didn't follow, but it sounds yeah. to me like um, correct. Because so. there's uh, humans are only going to like look at the things that are heavily boosted that oh, they can participate in. Oh, I see. And see, there's going to be a widespread of things that need thank to be you, agreed upon, in which bots will then stake and play against. And, Basically, and and, and, and and then play the boosting. Yes, both bot is bot are going to play that game, and but not but also people. And yeah, if you have thousands, maybe. You can make easy money from identifying you know, 10 out of 1,000 that are somewhat interesting. You bet on 10 of them, maybe two are your correct, you make yeah. you easy money. Exactly. Uh, but that mid-range where they're like important for someone to be solved. Can, can, can I redefine what your words in a, in a continuous manner? Sure. The more, let me, let me give you insight, OK? What if we have not two cues, but three cues? As you kind of like filtering, filtering, filtering. Or it can also be continuous process. But what, 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 what I'm trying to rephrase what you're saying and tell me if I'm wrong. The earlier the process <coughs> is, the less professional you need to be, the more non-professional the predictors you know, will play. And bots is just the, you can think of it as like the least professional players. But not necessarily, bots can actually be pretty wise. 
uh, if, if, they, if they, for example, derive from social physics, which is making the amazing prediction when it's about two people. Um, but the point is that, yes, there is like a gradual professionalism, and more advanced protocols will have like multiple cues and you know, filtering. It's just like that system, like you have filtering, you don't have one filter, you have filtering layers of filtering, of filtering, of filtering, and basically more professional layers inside and less professional, more robust layers outside. Is there arbitrage at each layer? Or yeah, it, well it should be designed in a way that, I mean, if, once you put more layers, yeah, there should be arbitrage at each layer, absolutely. Okay. It's, it's basically a social arbitrage, that's what's happening here. That's, I, I, yeah. I love that you say that because I keep saying that, but it's, so I, I, I'm so happy that you said that. Yeah, that makes sense. It's a social arbitrage, basically. Um, that's about it. I mean, predictors really fill up three roles. They signal interesting proposal out of an ocean. So you have ocean of proposal, so you have the fishermen. And then the second role is the warn from bad promoter proposals, so that the challengers. And finally, once you're skin in the game, to call for voters to reflect the global opinion. So that's the three roles of predictors. So the summary, principal tension between skill building and resilience of DAOs, or graphical consensus is the condition of being able to make local relative majority decisions in line with the global opinion. Predictors are incentivized to find good, unnoticed proposals and to warn from bad, overly promoted ones. Boosted relative majority decisions are only possible with a sufficient predictor's stake, the positive stake, and thus the warning incentive correlates with the extent that the collective attention is already diluted, decided proposals are guaranteed to be in line with the global opinion, and the resilience scale attention is resolved and transformed into economic question. If you have more funds to support calling clouds of predictors, you can indefinitely scale your organization. And that's the, I think that's the indefinite scale of religion, that's the, that's the point. So thank you for like surviving that like tedious uh, How do you get more funds? To, how do you get more funds for the predictor? Um, that's a great question. So basically, um, it depends if you have a circular economy or not. So if you have a circular economy, you, know, you, you know, distribute tokens on one end, and there is a consumption of tokens from the utility model on the other end, then you'd like the consumption of tokens, some portion of the utility, to be transferred into gen. By the way, I didn't tell you about our business model. So all of the staking around the ecosystem is in gen tokens. And there's a network effect here, of the network effect of predictors. So if you're making staking in non-gen tokens, they will just not see you. Just as much as you send transactions to Ethereum or Bitcoin, client of Ethereum will not see you, and you will be out of the network. So that's the network effect of predictors. That's our business model. Um, so basically, um, if, if you have a super economy, you would like some of your stream be transferred to gen tokens and offered for predictors. And and again, as I said before, that amount should actually be dynamic. If you have a short list of queues, you don't want to pay anything for predictors. Why should you? If you have an insane you know, list of queue in the queue, you want to, to pay a lot of them because they make more, most of the work, right? You're not paying for, for, no, for no work. You're paying for real attention. That you're, you're purchasing attention of predictors. And if you don't have a circular economy, which means that, for example, that just as Atomy does right now, you just you know, there is a God-given fund of eaters you want to manage in a centralized fashion. You just want to have also a God-given fund of gens to you know, gradually give away to predictors. And again, that, that giveaway factor will, should be dynamic with respect to the, the blend of your list. Can the bounty be token coin agnostic? No. <laughs> the answer is no, and that's to protect the network effect. So, no, so just as much, you could ask, this, ask the same question about Ethereum. Can the gas in Ethereum be token agnostic? And the answer is no. And why no? To protect the network effect and build the network effect of Ethereum. That's the same, it's the same, same logic. But you can shape shift. But you can shape shift, of course. I mean, for the user, it's agnostic, yeah. For the user, it's agnostic. I mean, you can build the interface such that users just see one point and that's it, and you know, everything happens, it's changing. <clears throat> but for the, for the actual, Network here. <coughs> we want you to pay gens. Okay. I mean, otherwise you will not support the network effect and the technology that is supporting network effect. So it's a chicken egg, and I think it's the right thing. It's not like a. It's it's important to have a business model. If you don't have a business model, you will not be able to long term project. Cool. I think it's and it's a good, great utility model because it has a strong network effect. Yeah. 
and, and it's critical. I mean, you can fork the code, you can do anything, you can do it without stack, you can not pay anything, but if you actually, you're not paying for the code, you're not paying for the contracts, you're not paying for the team, you're paying for the predictors to give you attention. So you're paying for real value. So the other easy use case here, right, is, the, is, is, is BTA and Menlo, right? So two companies. So what Jeff was try, is trying to build is like basically FinCEN, uh, like, a, like a self-regulatory organization early on where people make predictions on, for instance, Menlo, right? Like it's the obvious use case for the three companies, right? So Menlo is building a guild for investors. Uh, uh, BTA is already a group of investors that have already experienced the shittiness of the, the, the atmosphere, and then you can run it on on, sure. on DAO stack. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There are a lot of lot of interesting use cases right now. Um, I mean, I can I can also discuss and tell you about the use cases, but I think it's just so late right now. And yeah, what's well, the most counterintuitive use case you've come across? That's a great question. I mean, I, I, I did come across some really, really common use cases, I, but I need to remember them. So maybe we can go on for another couple of minutes and then see if I, can, if I can fish my from my, my, my unconsciousness on them. Where, where, would this, where would this not work? Where would this like DAO governance mechanism not work? Like in society or...? Uh. I mean, there are technical bottlenecks. I wouldn't say bottleneck, but there are technical barriers that are gradually resolved. You, you refer to specific uh, direction or generally? I'm kind of, you know, I deal in like the, the urban physical, I mean, as we do, but for a profession, the urban physical environment, actually, like toward Libya, uh, around the property in Bushwick, makes a consensus. So we <coughs> talk to the city about doing like a rollout for the community, you know, for, the, for Bushwick to be this kind of crypto savvy, Playground, you know, like a decentralized smart neighborhood. Now the question is, like, when you get, if you could fork online and you can go to any other community, any other place on the internet, when you get into like a real state uh, of people living in a physical you know, environment, I'm just curious as to how that works out and how they fully thought it through. So I'm not sure I understand the question. You, you can't, like, there's some issues with, with, with governance, right? Like, if you say, oh, we want to do a rezoning in this area, for example, and like half the people, like, you know, agree and then like, or like, you know, the majority of the people agree and then the minority don't. And you start to consider like more issues that would drive people in or out of the neighborhood. It gets to be like, like, re you know, real. People have to actually move. You know, it's not so serious. It's much easier online to just go oh, to the absolutely. online community. Absolutely. So digital, everything that's set up a multiple value system is only applicable when, on the digi digital sphere, basically. On the physical sphere, by definition, there is one. I mean, there is one governance system that decides either to build this a a, a you know a light a street light or not, right? So, yeah. So you need to be much more. So in a sense, in a sense, I would say that I, I'm not sure if I'm answering. I'm, maybe I'm completely like mishmashing your question. But in a sense, in the digital sphere, you would like to have any initial condition for this. So, so your initial condition or your, your, your reputation distribution ideally should be as good as possible. There is no ideology. Like if I can get better answers from better people, I would give them more reputation. Better with respect to what the DAO wants or how I define the DAO. So there's no ideology there. In a, in a way, if you don't, if you don't want to play with that value just four. In the physical sphere, that's not true. There's just by definition one value system and then ideology come in, then it makes sense, for example, to have statements such as one person, one vote. Which in digital set, in the DAO system doesn't make sense at all, because that's not what's gonna give you the right result for what you wanna get. But in the physical sphere, there's like, you know, kind of like, what do you call like human rights, and then it will make sense to have one, one person, one vote, and that's it. No reputation flow whatsoever. For example, if that's answering your question. I'm not sure. Yeah, no, I think it's very complicated. I think there's inside of a community where there's one person, one vote. There's also communities inside of a physical community that aren't one person, one vote. So right. It's, it's but it's but it's a complicated discussion. I agree. The physical is, the domain is much harder than the digital. I think um, that's where organizations would fork similar to like when you talk about the beginning in which, in which they can kind of like fragment outward, yeah. um, where like certain decisions can be made in different ways based on different 
like the needs of the physical organization. I, I completely agree, but if you're running like a co-working space or something like that, and you know you, you're, you deal with like well, people fork and have to like decide what well, are we forking and like huddling up in this corner of the co-working space or are we leaving the co-working space? Sure, yeah, there's just a lot to think. About. Yeah, well, I think that that would be the rules determined by the original DAO of the space and what the subgroups can then participate accordingly. Yeah, so, so maybe just to wrap it up, I can just give you one example, one counterintuitive example. It's not that ra radical, but it's like what the interesting thing is that actually going to happen really soon. So if you want to participate, so um, I mean actually two DAOs are going to start that. But um, so okay, let me tell you about one DAO because this will be the only functionality of the DAO. So the DAO that you're just going to tweet. So you will have like we want to generate consensus about like in the crypto space. So somehow this will reputation to you know, some collaborative crypto companies, and then that DAO just, just tweets. So there's a decentralized Twitter called Beepeth. Mm -hmm. It works. And all the DAO does is just people can propose tweets, and then it proves or that this proves, that DAO just keep tweeting. Uh -huh. Generating consensus, that's, that's just messaging. That's, we agree that that is true, or something like that. So we'll have like a Twitter DAO. Tweeting DAO. And there'll be stake to, let's say, like push your company's tweet that supports Menlo. Yeah. Um, and they will yeah. stake X amount of money yeah. if the community says it's worth tweeting. And I think it would be also a great tweet. Like we, our, our pilot is going right now, right, right now. it's start, really starting, also will tweet. And I think that would be a great engagement of the community. Mm -hmm. We have like 1,000 people in the community. Absolutely. They cannot make code, but they can, uh, they can suggest, think how many tweets they can suggest a day. Think that a DAO that is tweeting Great 20 tweets every day. That's incredible. It'll be a very followed Twitter account. So yeah. I think it's uh, so before we wrap up, Matt, while, while, while you guys are here, um, where, um, how, how soon can we put together like a, like a BTA guild on Menlo running at the Dow Stack? Um, um, have you heard that? Q2. Q2 ish, optimistically. I think, optimistically. Cool. I mean, we are, we, we are operating, so okay. uh, Q3, this, I mean, right now, basically, we'll have first experiment live, and I think by Q2, it will already be, it's already getting there, not yet, but by Q2, it will be almost like uh, at the WordPress time, you can just like combine things. And you, you won't even need us for that. Oh. Right now, you need us, but I guess in Maybe eight months or six months, you won't need much of us. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right, well, um, we're, we're all going to hang out. I um, want to acknowledge you for Thanks a, a long lot. flight from Israel. Yeah. And acknowledge you guys you for well. a long flight from Asia. Apparently, you got in today, too. No, we got in uh, Saturday. It's been a non stop sort of thing. Cool. Um, Awesome. Yeah. Who, and you I, should talk to Ben school? about um, the real estate stuff. Who is the technologies, by the way? Who is the like, technologist yeah. here? Yes. I think most people here. Most people? Is what? Technologist. Yeah. To some degree. You, you, you seem technologist by question, but okay. <laughs> just curious. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for that. Can I uh, engage you guys to help me just stack these chairs? Absolutely. Thanks. Okay. Nice. Thank you. 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 Thank you.